Just do it! Don't let your dreams be dreams. Yesterday, you said tomorrow. So just do it! Make your dreams come true! Just do it! Some people dream of success while you're going to wake up and work hard at it. Nothing is impossible. He will defend his police officers. Listen to police officers' commands, listen to what we tell you, and just stop. The nation needs to realize that when we tell you to do something, do it. And if you're wrong, you're wrong. If you're right, then the courts will figure it out. We don't get to take the enforcement. At the end of the day, each and every member is going safe. Sometimes the use of force is necessary. You need to comply with the police officer the way the system was meant to be. Comply with the orders of police officers. Resisting arrest is a real and dangerous crime. Nonpartisan Liberty for All. I am your host, Dave Bourne, and it is December 17th, 2015. And I'm coming to you live from Las Vegas, Nevada. Hopefully we don't have any technical difficulties today, although my voice sounds kind of weird. I don't know, like echoey, but hopefully everything's all right there because we did have some Skype issues previously. So hopefully every, uh, hopefully everything will turn out okay. Um I am here live with a new co-host and we'll introduce her introduced we'll introduce her in just a minute. Thank you for tuning in to Nonpartisan Liberty for All. We're on weeknights, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday at seven o'clock Pacific, ten o'clock Eastern. You can listen on Spreaker and Nonpartisan Liberty for All dot com. Of course, uh, this week we were on Monday, Tuesday, and Thursday because I had a previous engagement last night that I didn't even go to. I just kind of fell asleep and never got up. So anyway, you can listen on Spreaker.com and NonpartisanLibertyForAll.com. We promote the ideas of true freedom and liberty, meaning being able to to do whatever you want as long as you respect the freedom of others and don't directly interfere with their freedom, as well as exposing government for what it is, a mafia based on extortion that rules without consent, by threat of force and violence. And most to most people, that's something that never comes into their mind, but it is a fact. It's not even something that's debatable. The Every law, whether it's a criminal law or a civil law, is enforced by force. What do you think backs up a law? If you don't do something... Ultimately, what is going to happen? Well, it could go through a long process before you have a gun pointed at you. But in the end, it's enforced by the barrel of a gun. And that is the reality of government, which a lot of people fail to either think about or realize or care. So I'd like to introduce our new host, Vivian Fire is with us, who basically, in talking to her, holds uh, at least all the values and ideas that we have talked about in believing in true freedom and liberty, uh, as well as believing in being being able to do whatever you want as long as you don't hurt anybody. So... I'm confident she'll do a great job. She's feeling a bit under the weather tonight, but luckily she uh, showed up anyway. So um, how did you find the ideas of liberty? Oh, hi, Dave. Thanks for having me. Um, I would say that I always grew up in the same mindset, but if you can stop me to question everything, then I'll go along for the ride home. I have something off there on your mic. Is it? Uh, oh, you have your mic off. That's what it is. I'm like, what did I do? I didn't do anything. Yeah, you had your mic off there. So no problem. Go, go ahead. I guess I was always raised, you know, with the same beliefs that I kind of have now as to question things around me. And 
not to trust, you know, anything full heartedly without investigating it yourself. And as I got older, I uh, did a lot of reading, you know, I had a lot of time in my hands. And I just think that the things around us aren't what they seem. And that made me more curious to read more. And that's where I am today. You know, I'm still reading and trying to figure out this mess we all live in and how we got here and how to fix it all. And is that something that you, uh, did you grow up basically? And when I say grow up, I mean, as a younger kid as well, is that pretty much always the attitude or ideas you had? Um, I talk to people about this and we're not going to go into it in, in depth. Like usually I would uh, just interview somebody and it, that more of the guest that I have on, I'd interview a guest and I, you know, take the whole show and get into detail of, you know, how they grew up and, and, and all of that stuff. But it just, uh, I guess as a, as another, uh, question, and we won't spend a lot of time on this, but you you get people that, and, and I was telling you this off the air, you get people that were like, yeah, I was a hardcore conservative, and now I'm whatever they might be. And you get a lot of that. You get people that they started to smoke weed, and they started to question the drug war, and they say, well, you know, this makes no sense. What else doesn't make any sense? So do you, was there a time when you even remember thinking any other way? Or do you just feel that, well, this is how I kind of just grew up. It was just, you know, questioning things and standing up for myself and that kind of uh, from that kind of perspective. Well, uh, you know, my parents raised me to, to question things. And as a child, you know, growing up in our Prussian education system, I didn't really take much, uh, I didn't take much, you know, heed to what they said. I thought that because, you know, you know, you're with your generation and you're with your kids and you're being taught things in school and you kind of feel like the older generation doesn't know better because now we have a better way to do math, mom. Or, you know, dad, we don't do it that way anymore. So you grow up kind of rebellious against your parents, you know, from the state. And so I didn't I didn't really agree with them when I was younger, but I was just taught to question a lot. So as I got older, you know, and I had the time in my hands and uh, I care about things around me. It's just part of my own person inside. So as I got older and I started researching things for myself, I realized my parents probably weren't off their rocker with half the stuff I heard them say when I was younger. I didn't really believe a lot of the things they said, see. I just was taught to question everything. You know, as a kid, you're rebellious. But then as you get older, you know, it depends on what your experiences were or how you feel inside of how you direct your curiosity or, or what you go study and read. So how does that, I guess, affect you now in your life? Uh, you had mentioned, you know, reading a lot and things like that. But um, how does it affect you or is there anything that you do? I know you're not really into like protests and stuff like that, and neither am I. But it was even, and, and, and maybe even one of the reasons why you wanted to do the show was because you thought it was something, you know, you wanted to do something, but uh, didn't want to do those other things. I, I'm just speculating, but um, did you... It, it, how how does it, I guess, uh, my original question was, so how does it affect you now in as far as what you do and how you uh, live your life? Uh, it's hard to say that it really affects me too much besides the fact that I just like to collect all the information. I feel like I'm constantly dropping information on uh a map of just knowledge, you know, and you can't really understand anything in itself individually. But if you were to zoom out on all the things that you have learned, you can see the connections between things. And I'm still, you know, 15, 20 years of my own research. There's just too much to know. I think I could live 500 years and never totally figure everything out or come up with the perfect solution. Or, you know, I haven't really bucked the system. I've had friends that have, you know, not gotten driver's licenses and, you know, tried to not comply in a lot of ways like that. And protesting, I went to too in my life. One was uh, Bush's inauguration down Las Vegas Boulevard. And I only went to show my daughter at a very young age that you should question things. I didn't really want to be there. You know, I don't think it's going to make much of a difference. But I do think spreading knowledge does. And if that spreads knowledge to people, that's great. You know, and if we talk to people and they spread something they hear, to me, that's great. And I think that's the first and biggest step in all of this is everybody to understand what's actually happening around them. No, definitely. I think uh, people's 
knowledge or getting knowledge out to people is uh, one of the most important things. And that's why uh, I do the show. And that's the fit for me because different people have different things that they want to do. And, you know, some people will say that, well, I'm better than you because I do this and you should be doing what I do. And it's usually like, fuck them, um, because I don't really care what they think about me. Of course, you know, if you had a choice, you'd rather people think positive of you. And I do want to reach people. So I rather people like me than hate me. But as far as activists go, there's a lot of shady and uh, uh not nice. I don't know. I'm trying to think of a, a word without being too mean. Um, there's a lot of activists out there that are not the nicest people in the world. Not to say that I am neither. And I don't know. I mean, I call this uh, activism because, you know, I'm not getting paid for it. But even if I was, it's what I really believe. And I do it to try to get the message out. But there are uh, a lot of people that would say, well, that's not activism. And I put in more going to my protests and all of this shit, whereas they don't know the time and the uh, energy and, and all of these things that are put into doing a show. I mean, if you, I guess, want to do something that you don't give a fuck about and, and not plan for it or want to do something really shitty, it's pretty easy. I mean, anybody can get in front of a microphone and just talk. But to do something that actually has a co good content in it and affects people and is somewhat professional, I say somewhat because I'm still working on getting there, I say um too much, you know, there's certain things that I do that I know I need to work on. But I know that and my goal is to continue to improve and, and, and get better. And I didn't mean to go on on a whole thing on that, especially uh, when we have our our new co-host uh, with us today. Um, so uh Essentially, if anybody has any questions for Vivian, they can call in at 702-407-7664 or Skype in at Nonpartisan Liberty for All. I'm still actually looking. I did this before where I'm looking for my sound card. I know it's right around here somewhere. Not my sound card, my uh, my SIM card. So uh, I'll find that in a little while so people can uh, actually call in if they even call in, but I think having um, Vivian on might make more people want to call in or something. I don't know. Anyway, the first thing I wanted to talk about today's the main topic is we're kind of staying on what we've been talking about this for about a week now, because there were some shows last week that I did relating to the war on terror um and the it, it was a little different where we covered islam uh we had covered how they're using terrorism to go after guns and then we had kind of just put everything together from those two shows and then they did a little summary uh today's a little different it covers some of the th same things, but a lot of different stuff as well. So it's still in that same theme, I guess I would say. But there's a lot of different ideas and things that we'll cover uh, today. So before I get to that, I wanted to talk just briefly about this uh, butt chugging. And I don't know... Vivian, if if you ever heard of, uh, I heard of it a while ago with alcohol because I guess because of the nerves in your your butt or something that it gets you drunk quicker and you can't smell it on your breath. 
I haven't heard about this, but I know from, uh, you know, just being a bartender and going through schooling that you absorb probably most of your alcohol content in your intestines. So that would make sense that people are going to get more messed up off it, you know, if that's the choice that they use to to use it. But Yeah, I wouldn't want to put a bunch of alcohol in my butt. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I don't know. But now what I guess they're doing, there was a report of butt chugging cough syrup as a new way to get high. Now, I know there has been talk about different drinks, like adding cough syrup to alcohol and shit like that. And the main point for a lot of this shit is because of the drug war, really. If you look at even a lot of drugs that are around they ended up being invented to skirt around the drug laws, like this uh, thing that they banned recently, synthetic marijuana. Um, What it is, I don't even fucking know. But what happens is they can produce chemicals faster than the DEA can ban them. Now, that's the whole... Uh, set up of how drugs are put on, you know, the ban list is fucked up anyway because it doesn't go through Congress. And, I, and Vivian, I don't know how familiar you are with that, how they uh, ban drugs. That basically the DEA and the FDA get together, and I don't know who has the final say on that. I think the DEA, and they have a schedule. So, Schedule One means that there is no medical use for it. And what's fucked up is is marijuana is still on Schedule 1. So that's pretty ridiculous right there. But the schedules under it are rated by, you know, how serious it is, but they all have medical uses for them, and they're all legal in some capacity. So what they did recently is they took... um like Vicodin, uh, the stuff that's in Vicodin, hydrocortone, and moved it from a sub a, a Schedule 3 to a Schedule 2. So what that meant was, instead of being able to get refills, so like you could go to the doctor every couple months, you can't get refills on it anymore. Um, the other thing is that they pretty much can do whatever the fuck they want. So they took these things. Have you heard, heard anything about synthetic marijuana or yeah. bath salts or what, what have yeah. you heard about those? Uh, I knew somebody that actually got the synthetic THC uh, from his doctor and, uh, from his had, doctor. Yeah. He had a medical marijuana license here in the state of Nevada. And, uh, the doctor tried to get him to, you know, take the synthetic marijuana, which I just think is, I don't understand the purpose of making something fake that we already have the natural product of. I mean, that just, you know, baffling, except for the fact that there's money to be made behind that, you know, and they're trying to take whatever they can. Yeah, but I think I think that's I don't know that that's the same thing that I'm talking about because they called it like synthetic marijuana, but they sold it like, you know, they call it bath salts. And yeah, yeah, yeah. You're talking about actual marijuana that they're trying to now grow synthetically like they do it like fucking tomatoes or something like yeah. we're going to make synthetic beef or yeah, synthetic the THC compound. Yeah. yeah. So that's not what they were doing is they called it synthetic marijuana, but I, I don't really think it had much to do with marijuana. They also called it like bath salts. Oh my God. Yeah. I think I'd heard something about uh, air or air fresheners or, um, can't think of the name the stuff that you light you know and it incense uh, people were smoking that for a while and i don't know if that's the same as some of the you know marijuana well, stuff they sell inside the, the smoke stores yeah but. this stuff they would sell it at smoke shops so what happened was they did a raid um i'm trying to remember if it was this year or last year and i think it was in march it was either march of 13 or 14 i think it was this year and what they did was in new hampshire they raided a store that hadn't sold it in six months what the uh, agents did was they also seized like 20 grand in cash, even though this place didn't even sell it anymore. So you could be a smoke shop selling like one of the things that sold now 
that is on the DEA's list, but it's legal. And I've actually taken it before is Kratom. Uh, well, I guess the correct pronunciation is Kratom. And it's similar. Supposedly, it has similar effect of opiates. Um, I think you have to take a lot for it to do that. But if you take a couple, it gives you energy or whatever. But it's a plant from Thailand. Is it really all it is? It's like it looks like marijuana, really, and you can buy it at the smoke shop. So it they banned it in Florida. It's legal, I think, most places. I know it's legal here in Nevada. And I was thinking, I had gone to Orlando once, and I was like, well, what if I brought this with me or something? Like, what are they gonna? You know, it's legal in Nevada, but it's not legal in Florida. So. They go after all this shit, but then they'll just come up with new compounds. It's like when I was a kid, and I don't know if you knew people that did this, you might. They that did, uh, they would like huff like fucking uh, glue, like uh, not glue, but that uh, what the fuck did they call that shit? It wasn't like regular rubber cement. In high school and junior high, I would see yeah. kids doing that or paint rubber or cement. Gas, or, yeah, yeah. And they and they do that, and then there was the whippets. There was the, yeah. and I never did any of that, but I have friends who did, and they would use those to get high. And the only reason why they did it is because they couldn't find anything else, so they're like, okay, I'll use this, and it's more dangerous using these things than having them smoke like a real joint. I mean, marijuana is probably the least uh, worst. I don't know. That's proper English, but the best drug for you, I guess. Not that putting smoke in your lungs is good, but you can eat it. I would say that's the the biggest downfall to uh, marijuana is the uh, the putting the smoke in your lungs is probably not good. But besides that, um, there's all these medical uses but the DEA will still not drop it down to schedule two now not to go into a big thing here but technically what the federal government has done is totally illegal if they actually followed their own laws which they don't um the government does whatever they want to do because when they banned alcohol what did they do they passed an amendment because that is left up to the states in the Constitution. With drugs, it's the same thing. It's left up to the states, technically. I would say that it's not because of the Ninth Amendment. And, of course, I would say that it's not anyway because the government doesn't have a right to tell you what the fuck you can put in your body. But the federal government is violating the Constitution because it doesn't say anywhere, it says in the Tenth Amendment, anything not specifically given power given to the federal government goes to the states so when with alcohol they followed it with drugs they didn't but what happens is as they have their list of compounds and i'm sure they have to get detailed if there's not one that's on there people are trying to find different chemicals that they can use to get high so they'll find this new chemical and sell that or this and you can't ban everything what was i know you have a, an older child now but what was your opinion when she was growing up with drugs and did you talk to her about or about them and what did you say yeah i told her from a young age a young age about drugs and uh you know i i think that obviously the government i don't I don't personally feel they have the right to tell us what to do with our bodies. If you know, if you're going to go get sick off something and so be it, it should be your own right. I told her from a young age what I felt, my personal beliefs. You know, I feel that marijuana has a lot of medicinal uses, even if there's nothing wrong with you. You know, there's an Israeli doctor that there's a YouTube video called Cannabis in the Brain. It's a five minute video. And it's got the Israeli doctor that actually isolated the THC molecule. And he'll tell you that your body goes through a chain of biological reactions as soon as it hits that receptor. So there's something very uh, powerful and medicinal about that plant. And I told her at a young age, I said, I think it's good for you. I think you should develop a little bit. Uh, if you want to experiment, I shouldn't be able to tell you, you can't, you know, a few times in your younger years. 
And I told her that, you know, if something's not natural, I would stay away from it. But if something's natural, then, you know, I told her the same thing about mushrooms. You know, she's 22 now <laughs> and she's done them twice and she liked it. It kind of changed the way her perspective was at the moment. And I told her, I was like, it's, it's a little bit of a, a reset button, like on your PC. And so I think that some things should be left up, up to us, especially if it has to do with our own bodies or something that doesn't involve harming another person or you know, I think education is where it's at. I, I educated my daughter the best that I knew how. I told her to stay away from anything besides those two things and to wait on those till she was older, you know, so. And she went to government school, right? Oh, yeah. Uh-huh. But I assume also that you didn't really have, um, you didn't feel like you probably had any options and neither because I assume you worked or whatever. Single mom, it was hard, you know. Yeah. So. Um. Yeah, that's another thing. I think probably back then it wasn't as not that it's that long ago, but now in the past couple of years, it's become more prevalent where there's like communities where you can find um, people within your community that homeschool and you can have a whole homeschool kind of community where you can share duties and stuff like that. So People that don't have the ability to stay home or most families, I mean, even if it's uh, if it's not a single parent household, most families can't afford it. They both have to work as well. So I think it's good that I, I think that's something that needs to develop more. And I think like minded people need to get together when it comes to schools and everybody needs to take their kid out of government school because it just totally fucks them up. And, you know, I don't want to talk a lot about that, but do you have any anything you want to oh, I just I agree or? with you. I, I agree that, you know, our system was designed specifically to remove critical thinking. You know, they found out when you introduce something before it's naturally discovered, you're not building as many synapses in your mind. You know, you're being told A equals B instead of questioning A could be how many things you question before you derive an answer. So, you know, it's it's a very bad system, I think, for our whole society to go to and then have the government being the ones that's they're the ones that brought that system in there. And they're the ones that have, you know, an agenda had to have everybody think the same and rules of conformity are always implied. So I don't think it's the best option for our children. If I would have known at an earlier age, you know, of a system where I could have got her in or, you know, neighborhood people, I would have done that. But I was a young mom, so I didn't know too much. The first Yeah. And when definitely when she was growing up, um, you didn't have like, I don't know, you had the internet just started, I think, around that time, and you didn't have the communities you had now. So, I mean, this is really, I I think, new for the most part, where in the past couple years, where you can find, you know, kind of a group of homeschoolers and share those responsibilities. But back then, it it, it probably didn't exist. I mean, there might have been, but it to find them... Uh, wouldn't have been uh, easy during that time. Now I found my uh, my SIM card, and I, I seem to have not uh, misplaced my real SIM card, so I'll have to find that later. That's fine. So if anybody would like to call in, again, the number is 702-470-7664. And Vivian is here to to answer all your questions she is an expert in everything and um she's here to answer all your questions no but if you'd like to know uh any more about her thoughts on things or whatever um feel free to call in and uh ask her opinion because we haven't been getting a lot of calls anyway um, I don't think anybody cares anymore if girls are on and no call because Al- my ex co-host Ellen, nobody called when she was on either. So <laughs> I don't, I don't think people care because I figure you know maybe that's not why I wanted you on the show. But I'm just saying like some guys will be like, oh, there's a girl on the show, I'll I'll call in. But um, not nah, it didn't work with her neither. So oh well. Um. So I wanted to get to the main uh, topic and then maybe next week I'll I'll think of some other things to ask Vivian to share with the audience because I really didn't go into a lot. And like I said, I like to really my main question is that I like to ask 
ask people is how they got into, you know, found the, the ideas of liberty. And usually the people that I get into the long interviews with are people that are, you know, activists that are out there doing, you know, whatever, doing um, protesting and following, you know, uh, the meetings of county commissions or things like that, um, which there's nothing wrong with not doing that. I don't do that. Uh, it's just not for me. I went to one. I'm trying to turn this fucking thing off. I went to one actual, well, one topic, but one, um, what do you call it? My phone's like going nuts and I, I have it on like silent. Oh, you can't turn it off until you log in. Motherfucker. Shut up. All right. Now it's on. I'm getting, I'm getting texts, I think from, uh. From Tuesday. So I. I don't know. Oh, geez. Yeah, this text is from Tuesday. I switch in and out the SIM card on the phone that I uh, use for the show just so I have a different number. I don't want my personal number out there, especially with uh, certain people that probably just want to call me and like prank me and stuff. So anyway, um, I use a different number for the show. And again, that's 702-470-7664. And you can Skype in, which is the best way to do it because you sound better. Nonpartisan Liberty for All, it's all one name. Just send a contact request and your name and what you want to talk about. And if you're calling in, it would be best to text first with your name and, and where you're calling from and what you want to talk about. So tonight... Our main topic is, I had actually changed it, um, and our topic for tonight, we had changed to next week, but the reason why, so at work, I've talked about this, I work in an office so I can listen to uh, a lot of different things, which is cool, Um, you know, and I won't get I, I won't absorb all of it because, you know, I'm working. It, some of it I will, some of it I won't. But I ended up watching the debate was on the Internet, the master debate. So it's it, I guess it was the fifth debate. And I usually wouldn't watch any of this shit, to be honest, because I don't give a fuck. I think that. It's totally rigged. So whoever becomes president, and and these are the reasons why, and and Vivian, you can give me your opinion on this as well. So I think that, one, they break it down to two candidates anyway. So you have it controlled by two parties, and the two parties control it through money, and they're going to get whoever they want to be the nominee. They can focus all their money on one person if they want and put out all these commercials and put out bad stories about people. And so when I say rigged, I don't mean like they actually go to the electronic balloting and fuck with it. But they can they could probably do that, too, if it was like last resort. But uh, what I think is that. um. It's totally rigged. You have, so here's how I look at it is you have, and I've said this same thing a million times, whoever you want to call it, the Illuminati, billionaires, corporations, lobbyists, whoever, people with money, that the real people that run the government are not the people that are in government. I'm sure you have a couple exceptions, but they can afford to have a few exceptions. You know, they're not going to go after uh, somebody if there's one or two people in the House of Representatives because they know, well, they can't make a fucking difference anyway, especially in the House of Representatives where you have 435 representatives. So, I think especially with the president where there's, of course, only one president that 
you already have they've already narrowed it down to two candidates, first of all. And then based on those two candidates, it's totally rigged on who's going to win as well. So they they may already know there's rumors that uh, I, I had talked about how during Bilderberg in 2008, that there was a secret meeting with Hillary and Barack Obama. They got all the – and this is true. This part, the meeting is true that they had a meeting – that they got all the reporters on a plane and asked them, uh, told them Obama was going to be on the plane, sh- shut the door, got up in the air, and then said he's not going to be there or something. So they were able to get all the press like away from it, and that is totally true. Now, what went on in this that meeting is debatable, but I, I think it was more, okay, Hillary... Because Hillary could have went after some votes, I think, in Michigan or some delegates. I guess they do it with the uh, primaries. But she didn't. So I think it was, Hillary, you you give up. Hopefully, <laughs> by the time, um, you know, it's, it's your time, you won't be dead because you're pretty old. <laughs> I'm sorry to old people. I guess my 99% of my listeners are from 25 to 34, so I don't think it bothers them. But she's not that old. I think she's like 67. Do you know how old she is? I have no idea how old she is. Did she look to any of them, really. I don't it, pay attention. I think she's 67, and I think Bernie Sanders is 71. So that's what you got for uh, the Democratic side. You got two, like, really old. And Trump's wig is 105, so... That's the oldest uh, candidate, uh, part of a candidate that's running. But no, so so what do you think about, what are your thoughts about that? I've, uh, at a young age, I noticed that uh, it's just a cycle, you know, that they just want to keep everybody in the stadium from my grandparents to my parents to my generation. And next year we're going to change it. Next year we're going to change it. But, you know, certain agendas just keep pushing forward. You know, the encroaching on our liberties is a good example. And, you know, it just keeps croaching forward no matter who's in office. And they're, they got you looking at this and looking at that and, you know, which cup is the ball under? And everybody's so distracted with everything around us. It's hard not to be that, you know, the real underlining bulldozing of our rights being pushed away or all kinds of other things that are happening that are foremost on the agenda for decades and decades, you know. And, you know, I think it's rigged. I've never believed in voting. There's a video you can watch on YouTube. It's called uh, Rigged U.S. Elections Exposed. It's got Tom Feeney, the Speaker of the House of Florida at the time, currently representing uh, a different district. And he's testifying that he was told to rig the machines. This is a computer programmer. You know, this is him testifying. It's not, you know, just somebody's word or say so. Yeah, it doesn't matter what they say. So I, I just I don't agree with it myself either. I like you said when you were watching the debates that you normally wouldn't watch that. I never watched that stuff. It's been years since I paid attention, really. You know. Yeah, I mean it's it it doesn't matter if like tomorrow Dick Cheney could come out and say you know what I organized the bombing of the World Trade Center and you know n- nothing's gonna happen. People are just gonna you know, be outraged for like a week, maybe. And they might not even believe it. You know, I I don't, I don't know that they're really going to care. Oh, I agree. I mean, there's dancing with the stars and reality shows and people have a game this weekend and, you know, my favorite shows on and what are you doing tomorrow? And people are, you know, everybody's working their, their fingers to the bone. And I understand that the economy's gotten worse, but then that little bit of freedom, the people have they want to be entertained i think julius caesar said bread and circus that's all you got to give a people and you can do whatever you want because they're going to be entertained and fed and they're going to be you know feeling like they've been sufficed and that's enough for anybody just to kind of sit back and not want to do anything yeah and and it it's de- definitely the you know the bread part to me- meaning food you know back then i guess mostly bread <laughs> but yeah that i mean by today's standards he he would mean food of course but yeah i don't think it's it's weird because i don't know if you've ever read the book or seen uh harrison bergeron you're familiar with that i'm not sure if i have it doesn't sound familiar well i saw 
I think I read the story as well. I think it was by, I'm thinking Kurt Vonnegut wrote it. But so it was supposed to be in the future. What they did was to make people equal, like intelligence wise, they put these things on their head, like to make them stupider or to re- suppress their intelligence. And Harrison Bergeron, he was just too smart. Like the, it, it, he kept like kind of breaking through their what they had there. So he was one of the lucky people. I don't know if you want to call them lucky, but they realized how intelligent he was. So they took him like underground where things are really run. And the president was picked by lottery. It was like you won the lottery. You're the president because it really didn't matter. It kind of doesn't matter now, to be honest. I mean, you have all these aides that run everything and, you know, that whole most powerful man in the world is a bunch of bullshit. So what happens is he tries to he's like, look, this is fucked up. This isn't right to do this to people. And it it, it, it was a I guess um, about socialism, too, because it was about making everybody equal. So at the end, he somehow gets on TV. And um, and first of all, the girl that kind of brought him in he fell in love with her but she got kicked out because she got pregnant so they like erased her memory and she had one of the things on her and with her with his son so at the end he he fucking blows his brains out um the the actual video that they made because i think it was like a made for tv had sean austin in it you know sean austin is you ever seen the goonies the um, the little kid from the Goonies. Which little kid? Well, the main character with the inhaler. Okay, yeah. And he's been in some Adam Sandler movies. And anyway, he shoots himself in the head on TV after he tells everybody how things really are, and then people stop for about a minute, and then they just go back to what they were doing, and it's just, you know, you have that, and you have. Uh, The movie Idiocracy, I don't know if you've seen that. In Idiocracy, it's like 500 years in the future and everybody is just stupid because what happens is all the stupid people have like 10 kids, right? And all the smart people either don't have kids at all or maybe they just have one kid or whatever. So genes-wise, the people that are stupid those dominate so you end up in a world where everybody is just morons because this is like 500 years later and i almost see that happening like i think i'm smart but i don't think i'm a genius but even my thinking i'm smart i don't think that i'm that smart i think that there are so many stupid people that they make me look really smart. I honestly think that. I think that people are stupid because obviously I'm not like, you know, you look at engineers or you look at all the things that were created and I can't even fathom how somebody thought of an idea to build a skyscraper or to build uh, all these things you see, like the atomic bombs and tanks and all all this stuff. And, you know, I, I do think I have partial brain damage from being hit in the head so many times and drinking a lot. And I killed a bunch of brain cells. So maybe I'd be a little smarter. But, I mean, I'm obviously not in that realm. So if when you think of that, and those would be the real, you know, geniuses like Einstein and Thomas Edison, assuming – he did all his own work, which I think he did. Because sometimes you'll have those people that take the credit for other people. I I don't think he could get away with that back then. Um, Just as an aside, do you know how they they developed the moving pictures camera, like the the film camera? I've never never looked into that. I've never studied that. I only know because I went – my bachelor's is in film. So – That's why I know, because we went through the history of film. So what happened was Edison had a bet 
with somebody else about I think it was Edison because he in, he invented film. So that at one point during a horse running that a horse could get all four feet were off the ground. So like the horse was in midair essentially while they were running. So to do it, they set up cameras because, you know, film had been invented to take pictures, but they didn't have the moving picture yet. So they set them up all around the horse track. And then they looked through the pictures and they saw that, yes, a horse, a horse's feet does all get off the ground. But then they also realized if you put the pictures together, you have moving pictures. And then that's how they, they uh, developed moving pictures film. Video works different, but film is at least how it used to be. I don't know if they're still really doing film because when I went to school, we actually cut film. Like I still have a film I did, like the actual, you could see the pictures because all, all film does is it takes like a picture depending on the camera. Maybe it takes a picture every 30th of a second or, you know, every 60th of a second. It depends. And that's all it really is. And then it's just, picture after picture after picture like you know how you can do like a cartoon and you know yeah. like you ever see one of those flip books yeah, yeah. where you flip the pages and it shows like the person yeah i think cartoons run about 60 or 80 frames they even have some new technology coming out light field technology and they can run things at a thousand frames per second which was unheard of you know i mean nobody's even gotten to like a hundred before but the light field technology, it's totally off the subject. Very interesting. You could be walking by your computer and looking at a picture in 3D. And as you're walking left or right, you're seeing more of the picture as if it's really a window. So they're really getting, you know. Yeah, I know they're doing about. a lot with 3D. I, I, don't, I haven't kept up on it, so I, I have no idea. But I know they have the 3D TV. Until they invent something where you don't have to wear fucking glasses, I am not getting a 3D TV. And having to wear glasses in my fucking house. I even hate, you know, at the movies where you have to wear the glasses. And then if you don't wear them, you can't see the picture normally. Because it's, you know, staggered across itself. Yeah. yeah. It's so, I mean, I guess it's cool and everything. Like, I remember when I was a kid. Do you remember the, the red and, like, one side was red and yeah. one side was blue? And you'd, like... It'd be like, tonight on whatever channel, we're going to have this in 3D. And you'd get like the fucking, you'd go to like the, the convenience store and they'd be passing out, you know, yeah. glasses or whatever. Or in a cereal you, box. Or... You look like an idiot because one side is green or red and the other side is blue. And so I don't want to get <laughs> totally uh, derailed here off the topic. But so I was watching the debate and... <laughs> The, the main topic there in the debate was really they talked about terrorism. Like the whole debate was on fucking terrorism. And when you get a bunch of Republicans and, and they had it set up weird. So they had the first round of candidates, which are the ones that are the lowest in the polls, like they're not going to win. And nobody cares about them, I guess. And I don't know what they talked about. But then they had the longer debate. I think the whole thing was like three and a half hours. Um, they had the longer debate where they had uh, two and a half hours. They had the main people. And I guess the main people now, there's a lot of them. It's it's weird because the Democrat, there, there's two. There were four, but I think two. the other two left. And Hillary's talking like she's already president. And I we'll get to that because she said a lot of fucked up things. So we'll get to her. No matter who becomes president, they're all saying fucked up things. They're all the same. We're fucked. We're basically, uh, we're already fucked. Most of you just don't know it yet. But the government can do whatever they want. If they wanted to kill you, and they've done this to people before, they will kill you. They'll make it up and say that you ran at a police officer or whatever. Um, they can do whatever they want. And that, to me, is a definition of 
a, a what? A terrorist. Well, it, it a country that is, you know, it's part fascist, it's part socialist, it's 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 like Nazi Germany because basically if you can get away with that it doesn't have to happen to everybody and this is what people don't understand they're like well you can do your show and nobody comes and shuts you down so we we must be free well that logic is ridiculous because yeah they can shut me down if they want to one, they want to keep the illusion of freedom. Two, why waste their fucking time and bullets? I mean, I'm only reaching whatever amount of people anyway. So just because I can do something does not mean we're free because they have killed people, journalists. They have jailed journalists. Bradley Manning got 30 years in jail or Chelsea, whatever he wants to be called now, for releasing documents about the U.S. government doing illegal shit so um the writer for rolling stone i can't think of his name right now it's michael something his his engine blew up in his in his car it just like blew up and witnesses had said yeah it just blew up so everything points to a car bomb so they can murder you if they want so the fact that they can do all these things if they want to, but they just don't do it all the time. Does that mean you're free? Oh, of course not. It just means they're being selective with what they do. Right. You know? But does being selective mean, well, you're free because we're selective. I think the fact that if you can do it, it doesn't matter how many people you do it to. If you live in a country where you can do it essentially legally, um, you're not free. I agree with you. Yeah, I agree. So I, I had this guy who used to call me. He was like one of the trolls. Like, not that he looked like a troll. Like, a real, like, troll. Like, you know, those people that go trolling and whatever. And he would tell me that. He'd say, well, of course we're free because you can do your show. And I'm like, what the fuck does that have to do with it? Like, if the government wanted me dead, if I was a threat to them where they wanted me dead, then I would be dead. That's it. And they would legally be able to do it. Well, I don't know so much legally, but because of their laws, they'd be able to present it legally. I guess they lie, but I, I, I don't know. I mean, I don't know that they would be able to come out and say, we didn't like what he said, so we shot him. So, but they would be able to, a cop could just say, I felt threatened and I don't have my gun right here. I should get it just in case. Um, a cop could say, I felt threatened and I shot him and killed him and they've done it and they do it all the time and they get away with it. So how is that free? And, and basically they skirt around the laws, I guess, because I guess technically it doesn't say that. Well, well, no, it does say in the NDAA in 2012 that you can be like permanently detained. Yeah, indefinitely detained. Yeah. yeah. So, with no charge, as an American citizen, they tried to say that it was, of course, for overseas. But let's be real. Let's yeah. be a little realistic. That's just so, a baby step. So, essentially, the government can do whatever they want. There's not a, um you know, thing where they're going to do it to everybody. They haven't given up the illusion of freedom yet because if they did it to everybody or did it to the majority of the people, then people might try, try starting to fight back. But what they do is they're selective. They do what they need to do and they keep that illusion of freedom. They want people they want people to sit there and say, hey, I have a g good job and I have a nice house and I have my kids. And so even though all these things are going on, you know, it's worth it to me not to say anything because I'd rather take this even though they don't realize it does affect them to an extent. And pretty soon it's going to really affect them. 
So they're going to say, hey, I'll just, you know, I'll take my chances. Yeah, I agree with that. And, you know, you've, earlier you were talking about, uh, you know, in 500 years from the future, the possibility in the book or movie you mentioned of, you know, uh, the working class breeding more than a different class and, and well, making genetics that are maybe uh, slower than the genetics that are controlling Not necessarily us. the working class, but just stupid people. Sure. Well, you know, you look back even the the farming communities uh, back in the day and people had a lot more kids in those kind of families because they had to make it and survive, you know, and you got that aspect. You got fluoride in the water. You got neurotoxins in our food. You have the pressure system that removes critical thinking. There's so many things working at so many angles to make people just not understand what's around them. No, definitely. I mean, you got TV, you got uh, there, there's so many different things. Politicians, the schools are going really hardcore on how they're attacking and indoctrinating the kids. You got police in schools. You got all of that stuff. And we'll talk a little about that in the uh, the story in L.A. where they shut down the whole fucking city because somebody called in a threat. So it's getting a little ridiculous. Um, we've been going almost an hour, so we're going to take a break. And speaking of the L.A., uh, what happened in L.A., I was going to play a a clip of that. Well, actually, before that, let me play. Uh, I played this before, but General Wesley Clark talked about how the plan to destabilize the Middle East was created a long time ago. And this was not something that was just kind of on the fly. So uh, we're going to play that. And when we come back, we'll start to talk about the debate and how they really got into terrorism and got into some scary things regarding it, uh, the war on terrorism and what they want to do about it. And a lot of it is, uh, I mean, a lot of it is already going on, but when you hear them talk about it, it makes it even scarier. And you hear a bunch of people clapping for them and you're like, what the fuck? So... We'll be right back after this, nonpartisanlibertyforall.com. And again, if you want to call in, 702-470-7664. That's 702-470-7664. And nonpartisan liberty for all, one word on Skype. Be right back. A lot of people would say you reap what you sow. So how do we fix self-radicalized lone wolves domestically? Well, we've got to identify um, the people who are most likely to be radicalized. We've got to cut this off at the beginning. There are always a certain number of young people who are alienated. They don't get a job. They lost a girlfriend. Their family doesn't feel happy here. Mm -hmm. And we can watch the signs of that. And there are members of the community who will reach out to those people and bring them back in and encourage them to look at their blessings here. But I do think on a national policy level, we need to look at um, at what self-radicalization means because we are at war with um, uh, this group of terrorists. They do have an ideology. In World War II, if uh, someone supported Nazi Germany at the expense of the United States, well, we didn't say that was freedom of speech. Uh, we, we put him in a, in a camp. We, they were prisoners of war. So uh, if these people are radicalized and they don't support the United States and they're disloyal to the United States as a matter of principle, fine, that's their right. It's our right and our obligation to segregate them from the normal community for the duration of the conflict. And I think we're going to have to increasingly get tough on this, not only in the United States, but our allied nations like Britain and Germany and France are going to have to look at their domestic law procedures. General Wesley Clark, as always, great to see you, sir. Thanks for your time, and I want to pass along Thank to you, our Thomas. viewers. About 10 days after 9-11, I went through the Pentagon, and I saw Secretary Rumsfeld and, and Deputy Secretary Wolfowitz. I went downstairs just to say hello to some of the people on the joint staff who had used, used to work for me, and one of the generals called me in. He said, sir, you got to come in. you got to come in and talk to me a second. I said, well, you're too busy. He said, no, no. He says, we've made the decision we're going to war with Iraq. This was on or about the 20th of September. I said, we're going to war with Iraq. Why? He said, I don't know. <laughs> he said, I guess they don't know what else to do. So uh, I said, well, did they find some information collect connecting Saddam to Al Qaeda? He said, no, no. He says, there's nothing new that way. They just made the decision to go to war with Iraq. 
He said, I guess it's like we don't know what to do about terrorists, but we've got a good military and we can take down governments. And um, he said, I guess if, if the only tool you have is a hammer, every problem has to look like a nail. So I came back to see him a few weeks later, and by that time we were bombing in Afghanistan. I said, are we still going to war with Iraq? And he said, oh, it's worse than that. He said, he reached over on his desk, he picked up a piece of paper, and he said, I just, he said, I just got this down from upstairs, meaning the Secretary of Defense office today, and he said, this is a memo that describes how we're going to take out seven countries in five years, starting with Iraq and then Syria, Lebanon, Libya, Somalia, Sudan, and finishing off Iran. The truth is about the Middle East is, had there been no oil there, it would be like Africa. Nobody is threatening to intervene in Africa. The problem is the opposite. We keep asking for people to intervene and stop it. And there's, uh, there's no question that the presence of petroleum throughout the region has sparked great power involvement. Whether that was the specific motivation for the coup or not, I can't tell you. But but there was definitely, there's always been this attitude that somehow we could intervene and use force in the region. Are you and your family prepared for a grid failure? Shield yourself from blackouts with a home backup system or portable off-grid solar energy system from Off-Grid Depot. Off-Grid Depot also supplies water pumps, DC appliances, and other products for off-the-grid living. Power your prep, bug out vehicle, shelter, or remote location with a power system from Off Grid Depot today. Hey everybody, I'm Christopher Green. You're tuning into AMTV Alternative Media Television. It's a beautiful Sunday in Arizona, February 22nd. We've got the Oscars tonight. Isn't that exciting? There'll be so many people tuning into the Oscars, but completely oblivious to what's going on overseas. Namely, a general, a former NATO commander, head of all of NATO, I believe it was the years 2007 through 2011 range, General Wesley Clark, you probably remember him, he had a very famous interview on Democracy Now! where he said that post the staged terror attacks of September 11, 2001, he got a memo allegedly from then Donald Rumsfeld, Secretary of Defense, that said that the United States federal government would be launching an aggressive invasion and attack of countries in the Middle East, namely Iraq, Afghanistan, Libya, Sudan, the list went on and on. And he was flabbergasted by the list because he couldn't understand why we'd be attacking countries like Iraq and Afghanistan. You remember Bush's lie of WMDs, weapons of mass destruction, when the official bullshit narrative of September 11, 2001, which again, there's unanswered questions like Building 7 and no plane fragments at the Pentagon, etc. Couldn't believe we'd be attacking those countries when the official bullshit narrative was that it was mostly Saudi Arabian nationals on board the alleged planes during the September 11, 2001 terror attack. Had nothing to do again with Iraq or Afghanistan. Is back in the news. Had an interview on CNN, the mainstream media bullshit media channel, where he said that ISIS was created by the U.S. and her allies. So you're in a little bit of a dilemma on that. We need to leave that kind of fuzzy on this, but we need the authorization to follow the leads, put the troops in, and, and play this. Look, ISIS got started through funding from our friends and allies, because as people will tell you in the region, if you want somebody who will fight to the death against Hezbollah, you don't put out a recruiting poster and say, you know, sign up for us, or we're going to make a better world. You go after zealots and you go after these religious fundamentalists. That's who fights Hezbollah. But, General, I'm hearing you it's on... It's like a Frankenstein. <laughs> I'm hearing you on keeping Syria fuzzy, but, I mean, they've been very clear in wanting to destroy and dismantle ISIS, so that's not fuzzy to me at all. The question would be, if they wipe out ISIS in Syria, which is the goal, then what with Bashar al-Assad? Yeah. There has to be a plan for that phase. Well, some things you can't exactly plan that clearly because you're dealing in the realm of politics. So part of it is, can you get the Russians to withdraw their support from Bashar Assad? How would you do that? Hmm. Well, you're dealing with the Russians in Ukraine right now, and they're not being helpful. No, they're in fact, not. from Putin's perspective, he probably sees it as a, the opposite play. He says that because the Americans need us to help on Iran, because they don't have a ground force in Syria, they're actually relying on us. Therefore, we can push Ukraine further 
and the Americans won't stop us because they're afraid they'll lose our cooperation elsewhere in the world. That's right. Only more proof to the pudding. He must be tuning in to alternative media television. This is a valedictorian, a road scholar. I believe he went to West Point saying it's the U.S. and her allies that created ISIS, ISIL, the Israeli Secret Intelligence Service, out of thin air as a smokescreen so we can go and fight these wars that the general didn't even understand post-September 11th, 2001. Uh, again, this is just an utter lie. I did a video, our last video, asking what if, what if ISIS was just total bullshit? What if ISIL was a lie? It was a fabrication. It was the equivalent of George W. Bush's WMDs. What if? What if we were just being sold? Again, the smoke and mirrors campaign. We've seen it time and time again. Again, we, our government officials give us no reason to trust them at all. They lie to us continuously. We also had mayor, former New York mayor, Giuliani, come out over the past few days. Says that he doesn't know that President Barack Obama loves America. Yeah, that's right. He's not sure. Hmm. Does he love America? And a very controversial statement coming from a very well-respected figure. In fact, he's now getting death threats at his office, according to his secretaries. People want to kill him for questioning whether or not the President of the United States loves America. Newsflash for you, Mayor Giuliani. You're late to the party. You're only telling and saying what everyone else is thinking in America. This scumbag president doesn't love America. He hates it. He's a hijacker in chief. He's a Manchurian candidate. He's, of course, out to destroy it. It's why we can't allow Hillary Rodham Clinton uh, to become the next president, which will just be a tertiary campaign of the Obama administration. It's why it's so important that we provide a counter move to Hillary Clinton 2016. It's why I think, although you might have some disagreements, and I have my own personal disagreements, I've criticized them in the past, I think we should get behind people like Rand Paul, not just to audit the Fed, but to end the criminal Federal Reserve in America. Again, this is the same shenanigans we saw with the Bush era years, folks. This is the same bullshit we've seen before. The same lies. ISIS created by, U by the U.S. and her allies, according to General Wesley Clark. I mean, this is amazing shit. This is a very well-respected general. He was the commander and head of all NATO forces, not just American, but NATO forces, saying that ISIS was created by her allies. You know, countries like Saudi Arabia that are in cahoots with the United States right now, not just to put pressure on U.S. fracking corporations, but to drive oil prices to zero, to put pressure on Vladimir Putin and Russia, and to bring Iran to the nuclear dealing table so that we can negotiate with them. Those same allies, those same people responsible for creating these groups to fight, allegedly, Hezbollah, to fight the other radical elements. You see, the United States does this time and time again. It's how we throw countries. It's how we overthrow places like Egypt. It's like how we murder people like Muammar leader Muammar Gaddafi in, in Libya. That's, that's how and why Gaddafi was killed. We instigate the radicals on the ground, the terrorists. The same thing we've seen in Ukraine, by the way. We instigate it. We arm these people. We help fuel the fire of this terrorism. We promote the beheadings of Coptic Christians, etc., on Libyan beaches. The United States government is responsible for this. You know, few people realize this. They, they think it just came out of thin air. Like, they'd never even heard of ISIS before up until six months ago. It's like, where did these guys come from? I thought Osama bin Laden was dead. I thought al-Qaeda uh, had ended. I, I thought Obama had snuffed out the evildoer. It turns out to be total bullshit, according to a general, General Wesley Clark. And anybody paying attention. Again, ISIS created by the CIA and Mossad. Far more likely the United States is responsible for creating and her allies creating this entity than anyone else. For that, it's just spawning out of nowhere, being created out of nowhere so conveniently it can be the new boogeyman that we fight countless wars in the Middle East. This isn't just a couple wars. This isn't the bullshit Iraq and Afghanistan we saw with George W. Bush, folks. This is the world event. This is the world war. This is how serious this all is. Well, people just tune into the Oscars tonight. Yeah, will Birdman win the Oscars? Will that be the next indie film to win? Heard it's actually a good film. I've actually seen part of it. I'm trying to, I'm trying to finish it. It's probably pretty good art. But we have bigger issues at hand. You know, people more focused on Kim K and her accident that she got. And thank God she's, she's okay. You know, never wish any harm on anybody. Or when uh, Bruce Jenner will cut his dick off. That's a topic of discussion on TMZ. When will the Bruce, Brucey, cut his dick off? When will his schlong go? You know, maybe he'll give it to Kris Jenner or Hillary Clinton. I'm sure she's wanted a dick and balls for some time now. 
Very serious and very real issues. While the mainstream media dazes and confuses the populace, mainstream entertainment provides, uh, again, just an outlet so people aren't focused on. Promoting the ideas of true freedom and liberty, nonpartisan liberty for all radio with Dave Bourne. And we are back. I don't know what the fuck happened at the end of that clip. Um, I meant for the Wesley Clark part to play. And then all I heard was something about somebody cutting somebody's dick off. And (laughs) I don't know what was going on with that. So I apologize, even though this is a show that I'll say anything, but... I try to stay away from sexual references, not because of anything other than I just don't like really talking about them on radio. And then it makes the show a little more friendly, I guess, because really all I I think really kids fucking over shit like seven can watch can could listen to the show. I, I honestly do. Well, maybe not with that dick cutting off thing, but besides that. Um, because really all I do is curse once in a while. And I know they, they hear that shit at school. You can't tell me that they don't, you know, they don't hear that. So I I do think my show uh, is good for kids. I I don't care what you say. And if you disagree, then you're a bad parent. Fuck you. No, I'm just kidding. So anyway, before we went to break and of course we're here with the very intelligent, uh, Vivian Fires here with us, co-hosting. Um, she's going to be with us every Thursday until she gets sick of me or uh, she decides that she does not like uh, doing the show with me. But until then, <laughs> she's going to be with us every Thursday. She'll even actually be with us ne- next week, special Christmas Eve show. Um, we're not... We probably won't talk a lot about Christmas Eve, but it happens to be on Christmas Eve. So, And she said uh, that she could do the show. So we will be doing a show on Christmas Eve. So while you're, if you open like one present, I don't know what people do. Do you do anything like normally on Christmas Eve? Uh, my daughter's grown and she has a big family. So usually we do ours on off day. But I used to, when she was younger, let her open up a present. On like her, her dad's family? Yeah. So is he he there while she was growing up? You guys no. just weren't. No, oh, he just came there like later. He still never came around. He's still in his own. Oh, house. the family was always. Yeah, I see. Yeah. Okay, that makes sense. That the family was there. Well, I guess that must have been good for her and good for you because I'm sure that helped you. Like they would babysit and stuff like that, right? Yeah. Yeah. So that's good. Um. So we started talking about the debate yesterday. I think it was yesterday. Yesterday, the day before, was the Republican debate number five. And this one, at least in the second tier, and that's what I'm going to focus on, they had something where they had four candidates in the first tier, which are basically a bunch of candidates that aren't going to uh, get elected, but pretty much again, it's rigged anyway. But they're uh, they're basing it off of the percentage, I guess, the polls. So they have a small poll, I guess, or, or small ratings in the poll. And it was, I don't even know. Mike Huckabee is the only guy I remember, and I'm trying to think if I remember anybody else. He's the only guy I remember. Because he was, he had run before, and he's the religious guy. Oh, the other fucking religious freak there, that Steve Santoro, who basically is every, I think he wants the Bible to be the law of the U.S. or something. Even though he probably criticizes Muslims, because he'll say, well, I don't want to be violent about it, but I just want this to be the law. I don't know. Have you heard of Steve Santoro? No. Uh-uh. He's a big religious freak. <laughs> so he was on there. But then you had the main fuckers. 
you had Donald Trump, who, of course, is the most arrogant ass. I remember listening to Howard Stern, and I had brought this up before. And you know that he had a show, though, right? The the show where he had, like, a bunch of uh, people on. Yeah, I don't watch television, but I've heard about it through other people, so yeah. Yeah, I didn't watch the show, but it was... Uh, it was it was where he said you're fired. I don't, I don't even remember the name of it. The Apprentice, I think it was. Yeah, that sounds right. And he would call Howard Stern and be like, "I have the highest rated show. I have more money than than this guy or that guy because they had like Mark Cuban on once." And he was like, "Well, I have more money than him, and so does my hair or something. I don't know." So it, this is just. I feel like I'm I'm in. An alternate reality. Do you ever feel like that? Oh, yeah. The Truman story. I usually reference that. Jim Carrey, you know, where he's living in this. Yeah. I, I know the, the the movie. I never watched it, though. Oh, really good movie. His whole life. Everything. I know his whole life was videotaped. Yeah. And that was the premise of the movie. But I, I never saw it. But I feel I don't feel like that. But I feel like. Like, what the fuck? Like, we entered a different dimension or something. I agree. It's the the train of thought around you. It's difficult to comprehend how others don't see some of the things that we talk about or, you know, they're a little combative against the information when you try to share it with them. So like you have you have Donald Trump running for president, this arrogant fucking asshole who got money from his parents. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, just ridiculous. Yeah. Sorry. I had your mic down. Um and because it's echoing when I turn it up when I talk, so I try to turn it down when when um, you're not talking. But I think I can keep it in the middle. Um, well, when I turn this way, it's not as bad. But you have this this fuck that I mean, have you ever heard him in an interview or anything, or had any experience? Not ex- experience, like yeah, I was hanging out with him. But I mean, like seen him ever on tv talking about anything i've walked by televisions and seen little clips of it but yeah just pompous and arrogant and yeah not not an educated seeming individual regardless of the choices he made and how great he has achieved you know so many well he he started with money from his parents it's not like you know this was a guy who was born to a fucking plumber or something. Although plumbers can do all right, I think. But, I mean, it, it's not somebody who was born or somebody poor. He wasn't born in the fucking projects, and then he's he's Donald Trump. Right. Uh, and he went bankrupt a bunch of times. But he straightened it out. He said, I didn't go bankrupt. My corporations went bankrupt. Yeah, no shit, motherfucker. Because what happens is, for anybody who doesn't know about corporations, is that... You create a corporation because it protects you from personal liability. So why would he go bankrupt? <laughs> so so whatever. He, he is just such an ass. And I thought that when I would hear him call in, I'm like, and all his celebrity friends must hate him now. He was even on a Method Man record. You know who Method Man is? Yeah, yeah. From Wu Tang. He, he just came out with a new CD. Actually, I got it from the library. But he was at he was on a Method Man song. Like at the beginning, he said uh, he was like, "Hey, Method Man, we need to get this new album out here so we can hear you." Some shit like that. And he was hanging out with like P Diddy, and they must all like hate him now imagine so he's such an arrogant human it might be hard to well i mean he was arrogant back then but yeah. they were just like oh you know he had money i guess and uh he was gonna sue bill maher because he said that it was proven that he's related to what was it chimps because of his hair on his head that they uh they found chimp genes because of his hair it's like chimp hair or something or mm-hmm. or not not a chimp um what are those other ones? A gorilla is orangutan. Not a gorilla. Um, no, it wasn't orangutan. It was a maybe it wasn't orangutan. Is there one more that I'm missing? Well, whatever, whatever it was, they, a baboon. That's what it was. It was a baboon. Um, so he was actually literally going to sue him. So you have this debate. Everybody's talking about the war on terror. The war on terror. I mean. 
the the United States is basically a war on everything. Like that's how they describe is like the war on pants. I mean, anything they were trying to go after I mean, where's the war on the uh I hate saying citizens, so the people that live in the United States because there's a war on uh the people here going on right now if they want to use war what's what's up with the war on everything i don't know i just think it's uh they got to come from every every angle to make sure that whatever they're trying to accomplish you know falls in line the right way i mean you can't have a war on one thing without having a war on somebody's mind to create the kind of person that would accept the war on whatever that you're trying to you know throw out in front of them so just every angle i think they have to come at so it actually plays into part the way they want it to do you think it's uh like used more because you know how they test like they'll test words politicians and see what comes out you know best like they used to have the Department of War and they changed it to the Department of Defense because they're like hey you know defense sounds a lot better than war it sounds like we're attacking everybody as they are but they actually did more defense when it was the Department of War than they've done since they changed it to the Department of, of Defense. But do you think it's a like a mental type of thing? Like when people think of war that it's that it puts something in people's minds that they want to, you know, when they say the war on terrorism, that that uh, makes people more supportive well of course it does you know it's uh was it pavlo pavlo pavlo's dogs and you know he pavlog yeah he rang the he rang the bell they would you know salvage the conditioning yeah and so once you hear something enough times and it's every every if you turn on the news you'll hear it every day how many times dozens of times for years now before 9 11 you go back to the plo it doesn't matter how far you go back terror 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 you know and you just get a, an assumed reaction. They but. definitely do a lot of what you're talking about, that experiment with Pavlov dogs, where people that aren't uh, familiar with it, what he did was every time he fed them or right before he fed them or whatever, he rang a, a bell. So what what happened was he finally, after a while, took the food away and would ring the bell, ring the bell, and they would actually salivate because they thought they were getting food. Yeah. It's it's conditioning. Yeah, that's correct. You know, he, he rang the bell before they even got the food. They wouldn't salivate until they got the food. But after a while, they started, you know, wetting the mouth as soon as they heard the they bell. They heard the bell, yeah. yeah. So it's conditioning, yeah. Definitely. So I think with a lot of things, that's what they try to do, and it's it's probably stuff that's even in the unconscious mind. So. They all talked about the war on terror. Uh, of course, on that, they talked about within there the threat of attacks in the U.S. And that they're all coming. <laughs> these, so these are lines that were actually put out there. Uh, there's threats of attacks in the U.S. They are all coming to kill us. We have to win. And... I would say those are the four main ones. And, um, you know, my response to that is I guess we can go through every point briefly, but the threat of attacks in the U.S. I think the only threat of an attack is of the CIA telling somebody to go do something or the FBI. Now, there's about, shit, I don't know, 20 something. Basically, almost all the attacks that were stopped because they talk about that too were you know we've talked about this before it, and this is documented there's been tons of articles on it it's the fbi setting somebody up essentially you know seeing and, and we should do this as a fucking experiment is find somebody who's willing to to, to type you know this shit and and then when the fbi comes in in, in to talk to him well, they won't know it's the FBI, but to be like, I know you're their FBI. I wanted to see what the fuck you would do. Because it's like me being on the internet, talking to you and saying, I want jihad, 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 whatever. I Islam and 
I love ISIS. Um, and then the FBI intercepting that message. And then them, them, they, them then contacting me somehow, like on Facebook. They friend me on Facebook or something. Or they comment on something I have on Facebook or whatever. And then I start talking to them. And they're like, you know, I feel the same way as you, and this is messed up. And it would be the same way if somebody wanted to infiltrate what I'm doing, which is nothing. But if somebody wanted thought I was doing something and they wanted to become friends with me and they'd start talking about, yeah, the government sucks and the police suck and whatever. So, but what they do is they encourage this person and they're like, you know what? I can get explosives and I can get this and I can get that. And they target stupid people that are usually lonely too. And then it's like, um, Oh yeah. Okay. Let's do that. There was one guy I heard that had even got a job and was going to quit. Like he wasn't going to do it. And somehow they talked to either they talked him into doing it or they threatened him and said, well, you went this far. If you don't do it with us, will uh, tell on you. And, of course, you know, they have all the stuff, and then when they're about to blow it up, it doesn't blow up. But I think what happened in uh, San Bernardino has the FBI written all over it. There's also people that had said, I've seen, I saw three people. There's people that have gave different accounts. Um, Who knows? But, even if they did do it, I guarantee that they got help from a third person, and that third person was somebody from the FBI. I don't know what your your thoughts on uh, on terrorism are in general and things like false flags, or I don't know that I'd call that a false flag per se because they did it, but I would call it you know government involved or government you know, having something to do with it. I agree with you. I think a lot of things that we've seen in the media, you know, for years now, and it's getting stronger and easier to kind of look at, but there's so many accounts of people giving two or three stories. You know, the the movie theater one, uh, there was plenty of witnesses that saw two people throwing smoke cans from two different sides of the room. Or, you know, the Columbine shooting, and there's a kid that's in the mental ward now. He saw people coming out of the ceilings shooting in the cafeteria. He was there that day. He wrote a book. After that, they put him in a mental ward. He's still so drugged up that he can't even talk correctly to you. So, I mean, you know, there's too many witnesses of people that's, seeing that's stuff that's That's what they do right. to you. Yeah. Well, the one in, um, the one with all the kids, where the kids got killed. Sandy Hook. So there, they had an investigator, this guy, and I don't know what happened, but they changed their story a bunch of times. They're like, yeah, he had, because they were trying to ban certain guns that are never used, like AR-15s and stuff like that. They're like, he had an AR-15 in the trunk. No, he used an AR-15 during it, whatever. But there was a guy, uh, I knew his name too, it's like Holabet something... His last name was like, I don't know. But he is a former police officer, actually was an expert in school security. So he took it upon himself. I mean, he was acting independently to investigate what happened. And he got threatened by the Florida. He lived in Connecticut. I mean, in Florida, he got threatened by the Connecticut State Police because he was trying to get public documents documents from the freedom of information act that anybody can get and they had threatened him they tore down the school of course pretty quick so you couldn't get any physical evidence that way and he said that you know he doesn't even think it really happened i would say that you know there's conspiracy theories about crisis actors and stuff like that and there was a, a picture of somebody who was supposedly used in the same two different ones. But I think that's just somebody, you know, messing with Photoshop or something. But you look at this little skinny kid and it just doesn't. They were saying that for him to be able to do that, like he would have to be like, you know, one of the best snipers in the world 
to be able to do what he did by himself. So I'm not saying that he had nothing to do with it or what happened there, but the official story, it's hard to believe. And, and I know people will say, well, you're saying like every event is something like what event actually happened. And, and there's plenty of events that events that I think actually happen. But when you have a government that lies to you about everything and then think about this, they know how much traction they get from exploiting events. So why wouldn't they create their own event? Why not? If I really want to get this bill passed and I know if an event happens, it will pass it. Maybe I'll do. I mean, I personally wouldn't do it, but I mean, in the minds of these people, maybe they would do it. And I don't know why it's so hard for people to comprehend that politicians care. They're like, oh, they would never do that. They would never conduct something where they got people killed. They're killing people every day, innocent civilians in other countries. I mean, to them, really, what's the difference? And you have people like Dick Cheney that I honestly believe he thinks this because I saw some documentary on him that if it's for the greater good, he kind of said it. He's like, I'd kill a million people to save, you know, 30 million. Like he... There's no doubt in my mind that he would do something like that. So if it came out that he was involved in 9-11, it wouldn't surprise me at all, um, to be honest. But that same thing, and I don't know if I think I told you this off air, but I might not have that. Go fucking rent the movie The Long Kiss. Was it Goodbye or Goodnight? I think it's a long kiss goodbye. Anyway, it has Samuel Jackson in it and Gina Davis. And the whole plot of the fucking movie, I mean, it was that she lost her memory and whatever. But why they wanted to kill her is because she, I think, knew that what their plan was, which was to kill about 3,000 people and blame it on terrorists. And they even said in the fucking movie, the congressman who was going to do it said that, well, if you just kill only a few people, it's not going to be enough. You know, you need to kill whatever. And like the Boston bombing, I followed that so closely. And just even one thing alone starts suspicion, but I could name tons of things, but we won't get into that now. They said they had the video of him dropping the bag. I don't know if you followed the Boston bombing at all, but they said they had the video of him dropping the bag, right? Right. So nobody has seen, they showed videos of them walking around. They even showed just for the sake of argument that there's not a confidentiality thing as to why they didn't show it because they showed in Washington, DC, they showed a guy break into uh, some military place. It was right around my birthday a couple years ago and start shooting. So they supposedly have him dropping the bag, right? Which supposedly he had a black backpack, took his black backpack, had another backpack inside that backpack and then took that bag out. However, there's no video that was ever shown publicly or even to the governor. The governor even said uh, that the FBI told him. So, I mean, that's just one thing. Never mind all this other shit. So how are we supposed to believe anything that the fucking government tells us when they're so corrupt? And usually... There's always something where the CIA and the FBI were involved beforehand. Always. You have these two people. They were questioned. They were on the list. You have the the Boston bombers. They gave an excuse and said, oh, we didn't know he went to Chechnya because his name was spelled differently on the passport. We had the name spelling wrong. Really? You don't have fucking technology to not to to figure that out when you're spying on everybody and tapping everybody's phone, but you can't fucking have a computer that figures that out. 
it's such bullshit. Every time they don't figure something out, they give some bullshit excuse as to why. And it, it's, I think, now I don't know about every school shooting. I think there's a lot of shootings where there's a motive and some kid goes to school and shoots some other kid over a girl or something like that. And that does happen. It just happened to take place out of school. And I remember when I was a kid that, you know, there were people in, it didn't matter because they were ghetto schools, but there were people getting shot in the ghetto schools and stabbed and, and stuff like that. And then they talk about how many people get shot. And I talked about this, and I think I have this in here. If someone gets shot, right, what is the difference between if they don't get killed them getting stabbed, meaning when you look at, you know, banning guns, what is the difference? Because I don't see one. If you get killed by a gun, I see one. But to say, to use, well, this amount of people, many people got shot, those people could have just as easily got stabbed or hit with a baseball bat or something else too and if they didn't get killed. Um. I don't know. I know there was a lot. There's a lot of. Uh, I went off on a whole thing there, but I guess for for you, what are your thoughts are on uh, some of these? So there's the premise that they're coming to kill us. Are, are you scared that terrorists are coming to to the United States to kill you? I mean, I think they're already here because they've been doing the same things for a long time. So. I think it's just random. I'm not scared, but I think it's a, a definite th- – something you have to keep in the back of your mind and realize at any time something could happen. And it could be some bandwagon jumper or it could be you know, a government planned attack just to further an agenda. And either way, whether it's a bandwagon jumper or the government, they're going to exploit you know, the bandwagon jumper or they're going to you know, uh, really publish their own working. So, I mean, either way, it's going to still lead the people. Yeah, but doesn't that – isn't there more – isn't it more common for you to get killed by somebody else other than a terrorist? I would agree. Yeah. I mean, how many people die from car accidents? Or well, well, no. I mean, if you're or... if you're going to get assaulted, right, or killed, isn't it more likely for you to get assaulted or killed by just like a normal American? Sure. Yeah, I would agree. Because you know this whole terrorist thing is and. You know, and and what really is a is a terrorist? I mean, I guess once somebody committed an act, but like when you say that they're already here, do you mean that? Well, I guess the government has brought a lot of them in anyway. I meant the government specifically. And they were. Um, I got some information that they were actually trained. They were training. Um, al-qaeda way before not way before but uh or not al-qaeda but another terrorist group before the war in afghanistan but so what do you get really out of that so again let, let me go through these uh basically quotes some of them are paraphrased some of them are actual quotes So there's, of course, what they're saying is we need to do something because there's the threat of attacks in the U.S., which I think is a bunch of bullshit. I think the only threat of attacks is, you know, CIA, FBI. I honestly believe that. And there's threats of attacks of just people attacking other people. You know, how many people get just in a fight and then get shot or something or get in a fight and, you know, or people that rob people and then they beat them first to rob them or rob them at gunpoint or how many women get raped or um, whatever. So, um, um, when uh they say these things um 
you know, it's it's to me a you know I, I don't know. I I think a lot of it is obviously propaganda. Basically, all of it is uh, propaganda. But we got to take a quick break to uh, take care of something. So we'll be right back and nonpartisan liberty for all dot com. Uh, check us out there or call in 702-470-7664 or Skype in nonpartisan liberty for all. <laughs> Going in for Bill O'Reilly, and we continue with this special edition of the O'Reilly Factor, the war on terror, the political equation. In the 2016 segment tonight, do any of the presidential candidates have a real strategy to win the war on Islamic terror? We just heard from Donald Trump defend his plan to temporarily ban Muslims from entering the country. He also wants to police the Internet. We have to go see Bill Gates and a lot of different people that really understand what's happening. We have to talk to them, maybe in certain areas, closing that internet up in some way. Somebody will say, oh, freedom of speech, freedom of speech. These are foolish people. We have a lot of foolish people. We have a lot of foolish people. We've got to maybe do something with the internet because they are recruiting by the thousands. Joining us now from New Hampshire, Kentucky Senator and presidential candidate, Senator Rand Paul. So, Senator, are you one of those foolish people Donald Trump is talking about? <laughs> well, I think he was talking about the First Amendment. It's the first time I've heard people called foolish who want to defend your right to continue to have freedom of speech. No, I think it's one of our precious liberties, and uh, it scares me to think of an authoritarian getting in charge of our country who would say, oh, we just need to, you know, police the Internet and don't let people say things that we might disagree with. No, I think we need to defend the country, but uh, eliminating the things that we stand for, like freedom of speech, is not the way to go about it. Now, ISIS has been very active on the Internet, um, and, and the administration has pushed Facebook, Twitter, Snapchat, whatever, to, to police themselves. Is that the way to go? Well, it could be part of it, and I think we should do a good investigation. So, for example, I'm all for looking at the records of terrorists. I've only asked for one thing that we ought to do, which is constitutional ask a judge for a warrant, put an individual's name mm -hmm. on it. So I want to look at more records of individual terrorist suspects, but I don't want to look at every American's records because I think that's something that uh, one mm -hmm. of the things we fought of the American Revolution over. S Senator, what do you think of uh, Donald Trump's um, proposal, plan to ban, at least temporarily ban, all Muslims from coming to the country? Well, you know, I don't think we ought to have a religious test for who comes to the country. But also at the same time, I think Hillary Clinton saying or not being able to say who the enemy is, not declaring the words radical Islam is equally as bad. What I've proposed is actually a stoppage or a moratorium on immigration from about 34 countries that have radical Islamist or terrorist movements because we need to know who's coming here and what their intentions are. Uh, all 19 hijackers that came here on 9-11 came here legally through our immigration system, and they came through loopholes that I don't believe we still are policing so, so adequately. Can I, can I, can I so ask I agree you, with the sentiment. Can, can I, about your plan. So one, is, is Saudi Arabia one of, the, one of the 34 countries? Yes, there's about 34 countries, and they're predominantly Islamic countries that have radical jihadist movements, but we also have countries like uh, North Korea that are not Islamic. We also have countries like Nigeria that are half Christian, half Islamic. We look where the terrorist threat is and we say we do have to restrict that for now. But what I want is a system where uh, uh, Senator, until come, when, though? Until when? Students, you, say for now, our students. You, you say for now, but until when? This is, a, this is also a temporary ban on, say, Saudis coming over other, or the, any of the other 34 country uh, we, nationals? Yeah, we have specific uh, road, road uh, items that we would have to get to. We would have to say that we are doing this with our immigration system. 100% of the people coming in, we would have to know 100% of the time that they're leaving on time. See, we have 11 million people in our country that came illegally, and 40% of them overstayed their visa, but we really don't know who they are. We don't know if any of them are potential terrorists, but we also have no intention really of doing anything about it. Mm -hmm. So we have to fix our immigration system once and for all 
for national security reasons, and I think the first line of defense Senator, is to defend your border. I want to get this in here. It's likely to come up in the CNN debate next week. Uh, there are some out there saying that you won't be on that stage. What are your thoughts? Well, we think if they give us the same treatment that Carly Fiorina was given last time, that you measure from debate to debate, that we actually do meet the criteria already. So, uh, you know, we'll have those discussions and we'll see what comes from it. But we hope that we're treated fairly. Uh, I have every expectation that I will be treated fairly. But we want the same and equal treatment that other candidates have gotten in the past. We have a first-tier campaign, and we don't uh, plan on being labeled by the mainstream media right. anything less. All right. We're going to have to leave it right there, Senator. Thank you very much. Bring in retired Army general and former director of the NSA, Keith Alexander. General, good to see you. Thanks very much for joining us. Thank you, Maria. Uh, Glad to be here. This is pretty extraordinary that there was actually a rule in place that agents were told do not look at social media posts when vetting of people coming into the United States. Can you explain this? Well, uh, you know that the program that we ran had tremendous scrutiny. The concern always is our U.S. person's civil liberties and privacy and how we protect that. But you bring up a great point. And that question is, how are we going to address social media as we go forward on this war on terrorism? We have the time now, and we should put in place all the tools and authorities our intelligence community and law enforcement needs to protect this country. And that includes social media. And I think we have to take it another step, Maria. I think we have to look at what we allow ISIS to do with social media to recruit people. We've got to take on both of these. And this is an important debate that our country should have now while we have the time. Well, um, we can't uh, let this persist. Yeah, I think this is a really important point that you make. And I'm just wondering if it's a little too little too late. We know that Malik, the wife of the terrorism uh, shooters in California, was posting on Facebook her love of jihad and that she wants to uh, join the fight. And we missed it because our agents were told you can't look at, uh, at social media because it's politically incorrect and, you know, it, it impacts civil liberties. Right. And so that's, that's an issue that has to be addressed. I think the program that we ran, you know, interestingly, it was overseen by the courts, by Congress, and by the administration. While it wasn't widely known to the American people, perhaps we should put out what we can and cannot do. Let's take this on now. Yep. We can't afford to have another set of people killed while we had the opportunity to stop it. Uh, yep. This is going to be a tough debate. I want to bring in uh, former New York City Mayor Rudy Giuliani right here who's joining me on set. Uh, Mr. Mayor, explain. I, I can't. Uh, I do private background checks for, for companies, and we check social media uh, to give them the background of a person they're hiring. Uh, it's your easiest went, way to see what people the, are saying. The New York City Police Department checks social media to keep track of uh, to, to ca uh, track of terrorism. To, when you to were track of, oh, absolutely. All the way back then. All the way, all the way back then. When when something is when something is made public, and it, it isn't the, it within, in, within the zone of privacy. When you've published it, I have a right to capture it. And uh, these are these are statements that are being published. They're not, they're, they're not private. They're not private com uh, communications. Uh, if you allow the world to see what you wrote, then the world can include <laughs> the United States government, the city of New York, the state of New York, the district attorney's office, the U.S. attorney's office. And search, searching, searching social media that is non-private is almost a common part of vetting any middle-level to high-level employee. So to, you, to what do you attribute I attribute this? it to the uh, president's uh, uh, denial, living in denial that this was a war. All the time, he's, you know, since, since he's come into office, he's told us we're not at war with terrorism any, anymore or Islamic terrorism. And here, here's the irony of that. Every single day he's been president, Islamic terrorism has been war, at war with us. But he hasn't been at war with them. So he has us in some kind of a uh, ser uh, 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 not serious enough process to deal with the consequences of what we're, what we're doing. He's, he's pretending this is like a, a bunch of crimes. It isn't. They are at war with us. Bin Laden declared war against us in 98. Uh, ISIS has declared war against us. It doesn't matter what, if we're at war against them. They were at war against us, and we should be using the measures to protect ourselves that you would use if you were at war. The president, uh, living in a state of denial, 
is exceedingly dangerous, and now we're seeing the consequences of it. And, and, and General, we know that, um, that 40,000 uh, K-1 v fiancé visas uh, were issued, 40,000. Uh, many of them have gone to Asians. Uh, but do we need to go back and check all of the visas that were issued to enter this country in the last five years? You know, I think it's reasonable to do that, and that's a tremendous burden on Homeland Security and the intelligence community, but I do think we need to go back and check and make sure, and we ought to do that. But the mayor brought up some good points that I'd just like to emphasize. You know, we are at war, and because we're at war, this requires a national strategy and an international strategy to go after terrorism. We don't have that. We've got to put that in place now, and we are taking this as a tactical engagement or as a crime, and it's a war. And that war requires a campaign plan of how we're going to defeat terrorism. And it includes everything that you brought out, Maria. It includes how we're going to handle social media. It also includes the tactics, the international coalition, and other elements of how we're going to defeat this threat. Mayor Giuliani, what do you think about that? What, what should yeah. this new well, that's, plan look like? That's exa do you agree exa with exa the exactly what the general is saying. And, you know, the president had an opportunity yesterday when he went over to the Pentagon, and the, uh. Uh, and the headline of the article is, No New Strategy. Uh, <laughs> there is no strategy. Uh, and, the, and, and, and the horrible thing is that they have a strategy, but we don't. They sure do. Uh, we, are at, we are at war. What that means is we should be pursuing them where they exist. We should be using our military for the purpose for which it was intended to defend us. And they should, we should have troops engaged in defeating ISIS and in defeating the other uh, extremists who want to come here and, and kill us. When we were doing that in, the, in 2002, 2003, 2004, we were preventing these kinds of things. When they're hiding in their caves being shot at, they have a hard time using social media. When yeah. you give them the room to operate, they can operate very effectively. Let me ask you, General Alexander, about the other issue, and that is privacy. Okay, I, I recognize that this is a completely different issue than being told you can't look at, at social media because all of that stuff was public. So that we could have stopped Malik from coming into this country. That we could have done. But there's something else going on right now, and that is this, this uh, refusal or reluctance on the part of technology companies to stop encrypting communication, to give uh, information to lawmakers or uh, uh, regulators when, in fact, you know that there is bad stuff going on on social media. What do you want to see from technology companies, and what's the answer here? Well, I think we have to have a partnership with technology and governments, not just our government, but with the international community. You know, we cannot put it on the back of our technology to try to go it alone. Our government has got to help lead the way in this area. But our government cannot do it without the technology companies supporting. They are the ones that can help us break through this, and we have to do it. And from my perspective, we've got to get Europe on side in this case. What we're going to do with respect to encryption, that's a huge debate. What we're going to do to go after them on the Internet, that's a huge debate. Both of those have to happen. And Europe right now is divided. What happened in France, in Paris, that was terrible. They see what's coming their way. Now is the time for us to act in this area. Can, can you give the American minds. people that? Can you tell the American people, though, look, yeah, you know, you, right now it's a moment in time, and, you know, your information, your, this data will be shared with government. I mean, is this a slippery slope? Well, I think not if you do what we did. We had oversight by the courts the administration and Congress. And I would add in, you know, we had an ACLU member look at everything we did. Uh, Jeffrey Stone looked at this and said, you're meeting all the compliance. He'd add in a couple things. Mm -hmm. He wanted the, the data moved to the uh, service providers, which is done. And he also talked about perhaps bringing in an independent group every year to look at it. Good, let's do those. But let's give law enforcement and the intelligence community the tools they need to help detect terrorist threats. Now, we can't wait on this stuff. Yeah. You know, we're at a, we're at a critical point. We sure are. Yeah. You are listening to Nonpartisan Liberty for All Radio with your host, Dave Bourne. Call in at 702-470-7664 or Skype in. Username, Nonpartisan Liberty for All.
And we are back on Nonpartisan Liberty for All. If you'd like to call in, uh, you just heard the number, but I will say it again, 702-470-7664. That's 702-470, I almost forgot for a second, <laughs> 7664. And you can get all this information on the website, nonpartisanlibertyforall.com, and we have a couple other things on there as well. And you can also Skype into the show. Nonpartisan Liberty for All is the username. It's all one word. Um, Try to capitalize the first letter of each word. Um, Because I have another one that has a period somewhere in it. And one time somebody got to the wrong one. I don't know. But it shouldn't matter as long as you uh, just type the whole word uh, type nonpartisan liberty for all as one word, and then send a contact request what what you want to talk about and where you're calling from. And if you're calling in, it will expedite the process if you just send a text first with the same information, and then I don't have to screen the call and wait for a commercial. Because here, where we don't make any money, we also don't have any call screeners. So uh, Vivian needed to take care of something, but she will be back later in the show, which is unfortunate because I thought she was uh, doing a a great job. So um, but she will be back and she hopefully will be back, you know, permanently. So um, it's good to have her with us. So I was talking about these words that the candidates are phrases that they said. And and these are all phrases that I I've heard them before. It's not like they're saying anything that I think people haven't said before when it comes to terrorism. Now terrorism is a bigger focus now than it's been in well you know in maybe the past two elections but i mean it it terrorism wasn't a huge issue in the 80s or 90s for the most part uh there was some terrorist uh attacks outside the u.s and then of course there was the oklahoma city bombing which I have some inside information on that, and that's they lied, they tried to frame people, um, and that's what I mean. It's it's hard to ignore the fact that these could be false flags when one every time something happens, you get a new law. Number one, and number two is there's always information and i'm not talking about just coincidental stuff or stuff that you know oh maybe this you know it, there's always information that seems to be big and relevant and the cia always seems to be involved with these people beforehand and like the boston bombing and then you have Oklahoma City. Timothy McVeigh was a member of the military. And then there was actually letters saying that he was joining some elite group, like he was going to go undercover. It, it's it, you have you always have these connections. You never have just like a normal person that goes and does something like this. Why is that? And that's why another reason why I doubt that these things are done on their own and that the government has nothing to do with it. They have everything to benefit from these things happening. And the fact that they have an enemy that will always be there now, they love that. That's like. I'm trying to think of a good analogy. I mean, 
that's like offering somebody a job that they know will never end as far as you know no matter what happens in society no matter what like a uh what do you call it recession proof job no matter what happens they'll always have this job it's in a way the same type of thing so it's it's also so what does terrorism do for the u.s government well or what does it do in general apart from i'm not talking about it hurts people and that part of it i'm talking about the benefits so one of the things it does is you have an ongoing war you need the government supposedly in their mind is they can push across to people hey you need us to protect you there's a war on terror and 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 i'll get to parts here where people actually talk about that, that the government's there to protect you. You need the government because there's a threat of a terrorist attack. The reality is that any day you walk out your fucking door, you could die. You could die in a car accident. The fucking, your roof could cave in on you. There's been incidences where planes just fucking fell on people's houses. I think there was one in Breaking Bad, but that was... uh, a TV show, but it has happened. So you have probably a better chance of that happening, of a plane falling on your house than getting killed in a terrorist attack are probably the same. You definitely have a better chance of getting struck by lightning. So if you look at the ways to die, if you want to worry about shit, Worry about fucking driving. Worry about... And I'm not trying to worry people. Even that, you know, it, there's not a... You know, it's not a huge percentage. The two the two main causes of death is cancer and heart attacks or heart disease or things related to that. 2.5 million people die every year in the United States. Now, that's just the U.S. And if you think of, and I'm not trying to minimize anything, but for this year, if they call that a terrorist attack, I think there will be 14 out of 2.5 million. Now, police have killed over 1,000 people So you have a much better chance of being killed by a cop than a terrorist. Who are you more scared of? Because I'm more afraid of the police killing me than I am of a terrorist. You know, a terrorist, like, what fear do I have of a terrorist? Now, if they, I guess, were to blow something up, you know, they're talking about guns and banning guns. I have no fear of a terrorist with a gun because... I got enough enough guns where I can take care of them. Not that you need a lot of guns, but, you know, I'm not worried about a terrorist uh, shooting me. I guess they could shoot me before I shoot them, but I can defend myself. I'm not worried about a terrorist coming to my house and, you know, trying to kill me. So that kind of goes out the window. I guess at work, it's possible uh, it's very unlikely, and both of our doors are locked to get in our little office. So it's, you know, it's very unlikely. And the one thing that this attack did that others don't, and I, I'll get to this, is they they mention, because, of course, they want to put fear in the American people, that this can happen anywhere, anytime. This was not something that happened at some big place like the World Trade Center or something that was, you know, Disney World or something like that. It happened in an office. So basically saying, and I'll get into more detail when I get to who said it, that, hey, you know what? A terrorist attack can happen anywhere. And... They're, of course, using it for a whole bunch of things. But so 
the the major things that they were talking about about the war on terror uh get back to those the the threat of attacks in the united states and you got people scared of that because some idiot now even if you want to believe the government media story let's go through that for a second the, this fucking idiot was born in the united states I'm not sure uh, people, you know, the the people that just hear the headlines or whatever or hear, oh, I heard this. And you'd be surprised like that game where you sit in a circle and tell people what somebody told you. And at the end, it's something totally different. So they were born in. Well, they weren't. The husband was born in the United States. Um, the wife was born, I believe, in Pakistan and then moved to, I think, Saudi Arabia. But they're playing up, oh, they had pipe bombs at their house. Why didn't they use them? They had a wedding shower. Uh, nobody saw any, you know, any signs, any clues they're, of course, both dead, so you can't have them talk. Did they even do it? Did, uh, you know, from what I understand, they were wearing all black. Could you see their faces? And and don't forget that the police can manipulate a story by intimidating people. You know, just by police talking to somebody as to what happened, if they want a certain story... They can easily get that story. Now, I'm not saying that's what happened, that they didn't do it. Um, Maybe they did. Maybe they did it and it had nothing to do with the FBI uh, supplying pipe bombs and guns. Supposedly a neighbor did. So right there, I mean, they didn't buy the guns legally, but it, it, it... I, I I don't know. I mean, it's still one event. However you want to look at it. It's not the end of the fucking world. It's not, you know, I'm sorry for those 14 people that were killed. But it's not the end of the world. It's not, you know, something that happens every fucking day. It, it's not an epidemic. So, but of course they have to blow it out of proportion. So... The threat of attacks in the U.S., again, that's a guy that was born here. What's the difference between somebody that was born here doing that and somebody else that just, uh, you know, someone that was part of Islam that was born here doing that and somebody else doing it? It reminds me more of the, uh, because I guess they work for the government, some, uh, you know, the the term going postal where the post post office workers went nuts, you know nobody talked about uh, terrorism then. Anyway, they are coming to kill us. That was another. I don't know if that's exactly how it was phrased. Uh, I think it was, but I, I might have been paraphrasing. So they're saying, hey, they're going to come here to kill us. Now, first of all. Even if terrorists got, quote unquote, terrorists got into the United States, they don't have the means. They can't get a fucking missile into the United States. They can't get really much at all, to be honest. Maybe they can get a gun. Well, anybody can probably get a gun illegally. So... Plenty of people can get a gun illegally. And then you have Obama saying how dangerous it is, and you have all these fucks saying how dangerous it is, but they want to take your guns away and take away the right to defend yourself. And we did a show on that last week, so I don't want to cover too much of that. Uh, I don't believe anybody's coming to kill me, except, again, I'd be more worried about the U.S. government coming to kill me than some fucking terrorists. This is an actual quote, and I think it was said by Lindsey Graham. We have to win. So this is where I go to what is there to win, first of all. 
you win when you kill all the terrorists. Well, how do you do that, number one? Who's a terrorist and who's not? How do you even define that? What's a definition of a terrorist? Is a terrorist somebody who joins a group but hasn't carried anything out? Is a terrorist somebody who has built a bomb? I mean, what is a terrorist? And what is there to win? Because as soon as you wipe out one terrorist group, now I voiced my opinion before that ISIS, and I think it's so obvious, and there's so many documents on this. There's even a declassified document that was released ISIS was created by the U.S. and most likely England as well. MI6 and the CIA created ISIS. They're their proxy army. Think about it. Why wouldn't you do that? Now, Obama wants to get rid of Assad, and Lindsey Graham said that too. We need to get rid of Assad, so I actually had that on my list. Why? What does it matter if Assad is in power or not? Now... The reason it matters to them is because Assad is an ally of Russia and he made a deal to build a pipeline which could threaten the oil sales and threaten the U.S. dollar. That's why they want Assad. So they went through all this shit. They tried to blame him for chemical weapons. And they mentioned that, you know, they're talking about stuff and they're not actually changing things based on what happened. They're still going with the original story. So they said about Assad having chemical weapons and using them. They talk about just collecting metadata, like Edward Snowden, that story never came out. So that's uh, the reason with Assad, but we'll, we'll get more into that. But there is no winning. It's an endless war. As soon as you take out one terrorist group that you built yourself, now what they're going to do is you have plenty of people that are part of ISIS that are that do take it seriously, uh, that were recruited. You also have people that have joined ISIS because I've seen interviews with them. You know why they joined because they paid more money than any jobs they could get. That's what the guy said. He's in Afghanistan. That's why he joined ISIS. He could care less about their fucking ideology. He wants to get paid. Now, he might have to pay with his life, but that's why he joined ISIS. So this whole fucking thing that, oh, well, they hate us because of our freedom and whatever. It's not... Always the truth. And the guys at the top of ISIS, I think, could care less. They're making whatever deals they're making with the U.S. government, probably for money. And that's why they're doing what they're doing. But as soon as ISIS is gone, if you noticed, there was, and I played the clip last week, there's there's a, a montage about from about a year ago where you have Obama and Biden and um, I think it's just Obina, Obina, Obama and uh, Biden and they're just going back and forth uh, with different uh, clips about how uh, Al Qaeda is decimated and they're done and all this shit but then all of a sudden out of nowhere pops ISIS when they in, in Syria when they need to take out Assad that's being funded by the U.S. government. They're dropping off tanks to them and all this shit. So they need an enemy. And the benefits, sorry, that's where I started. What are the benefits to the U.S. government? So the benefits are, one, they can keep a huge military budget, which is, I think, what is it, higher than the next... 10 nations combined. So if you list the top 10 or the top 11 that spend money military on the military, you could take two to 11 combine, add those together 
and it's still less than the budget that the U.S. has. So they can keep their military budget. They can make money for banks, of course, because banks have to fund wars. Banks also uh, help, you know, loans to weapon weapons manufacturers when they need to produce more. They're getting loans from banks. So everybody makes money, and it's great. And then, of course, the main thing is they can continue to take control and power over people because governments, the whole point of government, and again, this is my opinion and my sentiment, is the definition of government is to take as much power as possible and control as much as possible, including people's lives, anything in the country. So they're using it, and some people are actually believing it. So they're using fear tactics, and they're convincing some people that they should be scared, that they're actually believing it. And people, some people are even actually believing the fact that, yes, we should give up some freedom for security. I remember an article from years ago. It reminds me of the butt-chugging article that we talked about earlier. But the guy actually literally said in an interview, if I have to be cavity searched to keep America safe, then that's fine with me. And uh, maybe he was gay. Not that there's anything wrong with being gay, but you know, maybe he likes fingers in his butt. But, uh, you know, by a stranger. But the point being that some of these people have this attitude that, yes, your rights can be violated. They think that they can give up your rights for positive rights. Now, the way I define positive and negative rights it's actually negative rights are good and positive rights are bad. And I may have it backwards, but a negative right would be the freedom to do drugs. A positive right would be, and this is what they're saying is freedom. I have the freedom to not be killed by a terrorist. So the government has the right to check your house to make sure you're not one. And they call that freedom. And they do the same thing with guns. I have the freedom to be killed, not killed by a gun, so we need to ban guns. Those are not rights and freedoms. Rights and freedoms come from the individual. You have individual rights to do things. So... They've been, I think, somewhat successful. I've said before, you you have more and more people figuring this shit out, and you have more and more people believing more in, in freedom and true freedom and seeing what the government is. But on the other side, you have more and more people that are falling for their bullshit. So you have a positive, but you have the negative. And on the negative side is really all they need. They only need a certain percentage to vote for them. The majority of people aren't voting. I don't believe in voting. I don't believe it does anything. I believe in noncompliance. And we're going to get to a point where noncompliance is impossible because when you have things like the TPP and military in the streets or uh, robot police, then you're in a lot of trouble. So you can wait around until you have no rights at all, or people can get together and say, we're not going to comply. And I also believe in self-defense. And that's something that people don't want to hear on the air I, I created a page. It's called Noncompliance and Self-Defense. And I have on all my pages at least 150 likes, depending on when I created it. My biggest page, I have 435 or something, which I know compared to a lot of people, it's not a lot, but it's a lot for me because not a lot of people even fucking know me. So, yes, that's a lot for me. 
on this page, I have like 14 likes. It's almost like people are scared to like the page because I'm talking about self-defense and the government. I'm not even talking about attacking them. I'm not attack- talking about attacking the government because I don't believe in that. I don't believe in attacking anybody, but I do believe in self-defense. So what I have said is not complying, and then when you don't comply, if somebody's going to attack you, defending yourself. That's scary to a lot of people. Fuck, it's scary to me in a sense. But it is what it is. At some point, the, the the whole thing is, if there's enough people that are not complying, nothing's going to happen. And that's the best case scenario. Or there's a standoff like the Bundy Ranch. I thought that that was one of the best case uh, scenarios that have happened regarding somebody standing up because nobody got hurt. Not the Bureau of Land Management or any of the government officials, not any of the other people there. And that is the biggest thing because I don't want to see people get killed. I don't want to see people get hurt. And frankly, anyone who believes in a war and go to war against the government is ignorant because what's going to happen? What's going to happen after, say you were successful and then you're going to have what? The same thing's going to happen. Then somebody else is going to take over and and the same thing's going to happen. The whole point is to convince people through the truth through the reality of how things are is that we don't need a ruler. We can rule ourselves. We don't need consent from the government. We don't need them to extort money from us. But to get people to understand and believe that is a lot harder than it seems, especially when you have the government goes goes all out. They go hardcore. If they if I was on TV, I would get thrown off so fast and ain't even funny. It would never happen in the first place. Because my ideas are dangerous. People might start believing them. So the government, if you do something little, it doesn't matter that really it's not going to affect them. They're going to go all out. Now, I'm still too small for them to really care. As far as I know, I mean, the Fusion Center, like I said, might be listening because what the fuck else they got to do. But they're using these fear tactics and some people are believing them. And you've had this been going on for a while because of they're going to bring in refugees. But even before that, they're like, oh, no, ISIS, the border's not secure. ISIS is going to come here and kill people. Well, ISIS hasn't come here and killed anybody because... Even if you want to say, at most, the guy was an ISIS sympathizer and, you know, that was it. So now if the if the U.S. government wants ISIS to ki- come here and kill people, then they will. But it's all on what they want. They also talked about all the plots they stopped. They love to use that phrase all the plots that they have stopped that we've stopped. Oh, all the plots, but they never really go into any detail on any of these plots. They talk about plots and that, well, our CIA and our, not our CIA, but our NSA and FBI and our, national the people that uh 
monitor national security, whoever, stop all these plots. And they, they, they throw out numbers. But, of course, nobody gets to question them on where the fuck did these numbers come from? Because they can make up anything they want. They can say, hey, we stopped. This was the the big thing. Hey, we stopped the plot to blow up uh, some underground bridge in New York. Yeah, we stopped it. And then they do like what I said is basically set it up. So if they want to find somebody to go and carry it out and then stop it and then say, hey, we look, we stopped this. So they can do one of two things. They can essentially set it up and make it look like they stopped it. Or they can just say, hey, we stopped a bunch of plots. Somebody saying something to somebody else on the internet is not stopping a plot. Unless you actually had nothing to do with it and somehow you found out last minute that someone was going to blow something up and they really could have done it, they had everything to do it, and it would have actually happened, unlike the Oklahoma City bombing where it was physically impossible to blow up the building like that from what he had. If you have an example like that, then okay. But the, the truth is you don't. Because they would be trotting out these examples. And and they they mention here and there like, oh, with the plot to do this. But it's like there was never any news article or you know, something that goes into detail or anything like that. It's just they mention it. So they talk about them, but they never, they don't give enough information for you to really believe it. So I don't believe they've stopped anything, at least in the U.S. Now, outside of the U.S., Supposedly, in many of the European countries, a lot of the same shit happens, and MI6 does the same type of shit. But in the Middle East, I know there's actual, you know, that's where the, I think the real terrorism is. Uh, Back to having to get Assad out. And I, I pretty much covered this, but. Just for people who don't know, all of OPEC's oil has to be purchased in U.S. dollars. So a lot of these wars in the Middle East or invasions of countries or whatever, they really have to do with the value of the U.S. dollar. Because if other countries start selling oil and they do not sell it in the U.S. dollar, and recently China's uh, currency was recognized essentially as a reserve currency. I guess there's like five of them now. But the main one is the, the dollar. But that more people, especially with all the shit that China sells, will be using, you know, could be using that as well. Uh, you also have, I, I talked about Tuesday with uh, Ken Shorjan that, and, and I heard this brought up on another broadcast in the U.S., that they're making it out to sound like China's trying to take over uh, the whole uh, route here where they're trying to develop a route that goes all the way to Mexico. Now, I don't know that they'll be able to do it all the way to Mexico, but it looks like there's certain routes that they shouldn't have a problem doing as long as the countries are on board. And from what I understand, many of these countries are because they're trade routes. Now, the part of it that I was kind of skeptical about and I had talked to Ken about was, well, what will China eventually do? Will they try to, you know, do they just want to dominate the economy or 
do they want to dominate, you know, take over countries or something like that? And as in his opinion, it's no, they just want to be, you know, the biggest, have the biggest economy that they're not a country that, you know, they're not out to take over these countries or go to war with them. So, but at the same time, I mean, these trade routes, they do all go to China, but you can go by China and go to another country too. So I don't think there's anything wrong in general with building trade routes that benefit. And these are commercial trade routes. They're not something that you can just personally uh, drive your car on or ones that uh, there's also ones that go through the ocean that, you know, on a ship, unfortunately they don't have underground. I'm waiting for that more underground, you know, tunnels and stuff or underground shipping. Now you also have drones. So I don't know how that might affect trade trading because if you don't have to ship something in a truck, what do the trade routes matter as when you fly it totally eliminates everything as far as any obstacle where, you know, a mountain or anything that gets in your way. However, then you have, well, if you're in a certain country's airspace, how are they going to react to that? So bottom line is, I guess, China's trying to dominate the economy and the U.S., is trying to hold on to the U.S. dollar being the main reserve currency and having all the oil continue to be bought from OPEC. So they don't want somebody like Assad who has an alliance with Russia as it is building some pipeline with Russia that will allow them to sell oil and not sell it in U.S. dollars. They also get a fee for the exchange, which is the SWIFT, where they exchange the currency for U.S. dollars. So the U.S. makes a lot of money off that. They're also able to push some of the inflation off on other countries because other countries have to hold on to U.S. dollars. So there's a lot of things that factor into this. That I haven't heard anybody fucking say. I mean, I hear it on very independent media that talks about geopolitics and the economy. And, of course, I hear it in Ken's articles, Ken Shorjan, the Daily Economist dot com. Of course, government media won't say anything. So to them, oh, they have to get rid of Assad because he's a bad dictator. According to Assad, and I don't know enough about him, I know his father controlled the country before him, but according to him, he's willing to have elections after the Civil War is over. The Civil War has been going on for a long time, but he is willing to have elections after that. Whether that's true and he'll go through with it or not, I don't know. It sounds like he would. But I don't know. He's a a politician, essentially. But after going through a long war, he might not want to be the the person in power. Now, if he's not, I don't know how he's going to live. You know, I'm sure there are people that want to kill him besides the United States. But maybe he can uh, go to Russia (laughs) or something. But they're they're keyed on getting Assad, Obama is. And if you remember a couple years ago, they blamed that sarin gas thing on him when it was the rebels who got the gas from the CIA in the fucking first place. It's, it's, it's crazy, man. It, it really is. It's, 
it's really the government is just going to do whatever they're going to do. Now, they could say, well, we're doing it for the good of the American people because we want to keep the economy good. Well, they're not just hurting people in other countries. They're, they've basically declared war on anybody who lives in America as well, the U.S. government. Because to them, anybody's a terrorist, anybody's a threat to what they want to accomplish. So in a way, like I said, you could take me as a threat because of what I say. Now, there's not enough people listening to me for it to matter. But if there was, it may matter. If people actually started doing... So... I guess this would be a scenario where they, there's no way they wouldn't go after me. So, and I'm just using me as an example because I could, you know, I could use somebody else too. But if so, I have an idea of what I think people should do. I don't think people should vote. I don't think people should get involved in politics. I already went through the whole process. You got to find a candidate. Then you got to find somebody who would submit your bill. Then you got to find, get them to convince people to vote on it. You got to get it out of committee. You got to go through this whole, whole thing. And most likely nothing's going to happen anyway. Or you could immediately say, fuck you. I'm not doing this. Now, if you do that yourself, most likely you'll get arrested. However, if a big enough group of people do it, then they can't arrest everybody. And that's what I'm pushing. And I wish more people would get on board with that, to be honest, but I don't fault them for not, you know, some people want to use the system. Some people want to protest. Some people want to do civil disobedience. Some want to do whatever. And I'm also advocating, I shouldn't say advocating. I'm also saying hypothetically that if you got a whole bunch of people to not obey a law and again, I'm only talking about laws that don't hurt anybody. I'm not talking about anything that hurts somebody directly, that directly interferes with somebody else's freedom. But I'm also saying that if a bunch of people got together and said, we're not obeying this law, that at the same time, hypothetically, that it's a law that is illegal, that it's not a legal law. That kind of sounds weird, but meaning that any law that doesn't hurt anybody directly goes against the Ninth Amendment and against the Constitution. Of course, the Ninth Amendment saying just because we didn't list it here doesn't mean you don't have the right to do it. So to me, that's saying you have the right to do everything you want as long as you don't hurt anybody. So basically the people that are coming after you are breaking the law. And if somebody comes after you for just exercising your legal rights, you have the right to defend yourself. And hypothetically, if people did this, and it happened over and over again. You know, the people that were attacking the free people just trying to exercise their rights might stop doing it. Now, there's many people that don't believe in things like that because they believe in total peace, no matter what. Even if they get punched in the face, they believe that they should sit there and take it like an idiot. Now, I don't believe self-defense is violence. Violence is attacking somebody. 
But somebody attacking you and defending yourself is self-defense. So my point being, if I got that big and say that was my idea that I spread, I'm saying hypothetically, I, I spread that idea and all of these people started listening to it, you can guarantee that I'm probably not going to be around that long. Either they're going to charge me with some bullshit crime, like inciting whatever, or they're just going to kill me and say I had like a heart attack or something, or, you know, have my engine blow up on my car like they did to that guy for the from the Rolling Stone magazine. Or hang me and say I killed myself like they did to the guy from uh, The Hacker. I'm sorry, I don't know his name. It was Michael something, I believe. And I owe him more respect than I just called him The Hacker. But they were saying that, you know, even though he was facing 20 years, that he was, he was you know, not excited, but he was going to defend his case. And he said, this shit is bullshit, and I'm going to do what I got to do to defend my case. So, and then he hangs himself. And then there's no question. Andrew Breitbart was 40, died of a heart attack, had no heart trouble, no nothing. And it's just like, yeah, that's it. And then I I think there was something about the autopsy that they rigged to. So who knows how many people are killed by the government? These are just people we know of. What about all the newspaper people and and people of the press that have been gone after? So it's, it's crazy. This is the reality. It's East Germany, and I call it East Germany again because they're not out attacking country. Well, that's not true. They are. So I might as well call it Nazi Germany, but they're... And now they're talking about lists of Muslims. So once they start that, they're really Nazi Germany. So then you have the, if we don't get them here, they, I mean, if we don't get them there, they'll get us here. That goes back to Bush and, and of course that's bullshit. And I do think that some of it has to do with the U.S. interference. It depends on the person, but it it, you can't say that that's not a factor at all, that the U.S. interference in the Middle East and drone bombing and all that is doesn't factor in to some of these people wanting to the people that want to attack the U.S., Uh, wanting to attack the U.S. I mean, that's that's just, you know, common sense. If somebody, you know, Obama likes to talk so much about common sense, what about the common sense of you're bombing and killing all these people over there, all these innocent civilians? You don't think that their relatives aren't going to want to kill you? Now, I don't think it's okay to stoop to the same level and say, well, they dropped, the U.S. government dropped bombs, so I'm going to attack the American people. Um, Going for the government is another story, especially if they're in their country. So I don't blame... You know, they called them insurgents and all this shit. I don't blame anybody in Iraq that attacked the military in Iraq. Uh, You know, besides the, you had the Saddam Hussein army and all that. I'm talking about after that. I'm talking about when you're living in an occupied country and they expect the military, you know, I've seen videos of it and whatever, and the military weren't too good to them neither. And even if they were, I mean, 
your country has been invaded. Think about it. You have military on your streets. So you're going to tell me in the U.S. If, if the Chinese army wasn't rolling around that you wouldn't try to attack them? If you could, I mean, you might not because you'd get killed. But if you had ways of, you know, snipers or whatever you could do, that you wouldn't do that. Their country was invaded. And then they didn't leave. If they were there to get Saddam Hussein, then fucking leave. Of course, what they did by doing that was just to stabilize the whole region. So that whole, if we don't get them there, they'll get us here is BS. Um, Part of it, you know, if any of it is true, it's based on, again, the fact that what the U.S. has done to those countries, but they don't really have the means, and they're sitting there fighting each other. You know, Iraq and Iran fought for like 10 years because of the Sunni-Shiite thing. So they're busy fighting each other for power. The other thing that had come up is lying about the data they collected. And I mentioned this a little earlier that they they're talking about how they collect the metadata and whatever. And they they want to collect more stuff and spy on more Americans. They're talking like before Edward Snowden, like a a pre Edward Snowden society. And that those documents like were never released. They're not recognizing what was released. They're trying to, I don't know what they're trying to do that people will just forget. I actually, I think they probably are because a lot of people probably aren't even unaware and they probably still think, Oh, it's just metadata and all of this shit. And it's totally, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Irresponsible to even do that. But on top of what they do, they're saying that's not enough. We need more. They're they're also talking about, uh, well, I'll get to this when I get to this person, but they didn't talk about it in this debate, but, you know, the tech companies and all that. But I'll get to that uh, when I get to the next section. But but they want to focus. They want people to focus on this war on terror. Because if you're focusing on the war on terror, you're not focusing about all the laws the government's passing to take away more freedoms. You're not focusing on the police and them killing people. And, of course, they brought up the police and, you know, how great they were and everything that they did for everybody and all that shit. I've never heard a politician say any a one word bad about a cop ever. But they just want to take over the life of everyone and everything. So they want to distract you with terrorism. They want you to worry about that and be in fear of that and be supporting the government. And please, guys, save us from terrorism. Help us. We're we're helpless against terrorists, which is fucking ridiculous. Buy a gun a gas mask, and a bulletproof vest. There you go. They can't make these fucking bombs that are going to do the damage that you think they are. Even look at the Boston bombing. Of course, they showed you the people whose legs got blown off, and that's terrible, and I feel so bad for them. And I'm glad that they have a lot of uh, things that can help them, whether it's, you know, robot legs or things like that. And the technology is just getting better and better. But, yes, there were people injured. There was 200 and something people injured. But they counted injuries like people running and falling and scraping their legs. 
the amount of people whose legs were blown off or body parts were blown off was not like 200. I don't know what the number was, so I don't want to say. But I'm thinking it was more like 10. Now, that's still too many. But they can't get into the United States and make the kind of bombs that you're thinking that they're going to make. And even with the suicide bombers, they don't kill too many people. And I'm not saying that it's okay for anybody to die. But at the same time, so we're supposed to get all these freedoms taken away because maybe this might happen and a couple people may die. I'm sorry that there's a price for freedom. And on top of that is this is not even happening. It's their fucking bullshit saying it's going to happen. There's over 300 million people in the U.S., And look how many terrorist attacks there are. If people are so nuts and crazy and, you know, you'd see, even with the the nuts and crazy people, which don't even make up 1% of the population, shit isn't that dangerous, man. They want you to think it is. That's why on government media... Yeah, what's the number one story? Oh, somebody got shot and killed. Is that what news is about? Is that really news? Now, you've been brought up to think that that's news, that that's the top story, that somebody shot a bunch of people. But what is it really? I don't know. I know that since the 50s, the CIA, which is not supposed to operate in the United States, has been involved in television stations and has had people placed there. So I'm going to take a break. When we come back, I'm going to talk about Hillary Clinton's speech and some of the scarier shit that she said. Later, we'll also talk about what happened at the Los Angeles schools when a fake, from what I understand, bomb threat was made and they shut down the entire school system. So we'll be right back after this nonpartisan liberty for all dot com. District police say that they are considering closing all schools today over what is being called a credible threat. Investigators say this situation is fluid, but we are getting reports that the school buses have been called back to their depots. Let's listen. Uh, he, uh, shared with me. Uh, the threat that had been made to not one school, but many schools uh, in this school district. Uh, uh, he shared with me that some of the details talked about uh, backpacks, uh, talked about uh, other packages, uh, and uh, after uh, talking with him, uh, also with the board president, uh, I made a decision to close all of the schools. Uh, I have alerted all six superintendents. Uh, they have been alerted. I've asked them to have their operations people uh, talk to the plant managers at each school. I've asked the plant managers uh, to walk the school 
and if they see anything that is out of order, to contact the police. Not to touch anything, not to do anything, but to, to if they see anything out of line, uh, to contact the proper authorities. Uh, we made contact with our early education centers uh, because these are our young children. Uh, we made contact with our special education to make sure that those that are not as mobile as some of our special students are taken care of. Uh, we have made contact with our adult education schools. We have made contact with our charter schools because the Board of Education has responsibility uh, and the district for all charter schools. So I've asked that they be closed also. Uh, I think it is important uh, that I take the precaution uh, based on what has happened recently and what has happened in the past. Uh, I have asked the chief to be working with the uh, city police department and the sheriff uh, before the day is over. I want every school searched to make sure that it is safe for children and safe for staff to be there uh, on Wednesday. I will issue a statement late this afternoon uh, after the chief, the Chief Zipperman, uh, has informed me uh, that schools have been searched uh, and uh, it is okay. Uh, I will keep you informed ongoing during the day if there are any uh, uh, situations. One of the issues I've been worried about is children who walk to school. Uh, we have a great many of those, and so I've asked the principal uh, to make sure that those children are at a specific gate so they can be given instructions, uh, kept together, uh, and so that we can make contact with parents to pick up their children or to make sure that they get home safely, not independently, home safely, uh, uh, making sure that their parents are notified. We have sent a connect ed to all parents, uh, letting them know of the action I've taken. Uh, I will answer some questions after the chief uh, and the board president uh, uh, speak with you. Chief? Superintendent Ford, could you start just from the beginning with a couple of people arrived late? Chief? Uh, good morning, uh, Steve Zipperman, the chief of Los Angeles School Police Department. And uh, I just want to uh, reiterate what Superintendent Cortinas um, already stated. Earlier this morning, uh, we did receive a, an electronic threat uh, that uh, mentions uh, the safety um, of our schools. As a result of that threat, uh, not only the Los Angeles School Police Department, Can you start but again, sir? excuse me. Can you start again? Yeah. No. Okay. Um, I'm going to continue on that. As a result of that threat, uh, the Los Angeles School Police Department, as well as Los Angeles Police Department, and the uh, FBI were notified, and right now the threat is still being analyzed in an abundance of caution uh, as superintendent cortinas has indicated uh, we have chosen to close our schools today until we can be absolutely sure that our campuses are safe and until it is deemed safe by law enforcement and concurred with our district officials uh, which we believe will uh, be able to occur by the by the end of this day uh, we will keep those schools closed. Um, the investigation is ongoing. I'm not going to get into the details. I do want to say this. This is important. That the threat that was received, as far as the LA Unified School District is concerned, pertained to the LA Unified School District. I know there's been many calls. I can tell you that um, we know of no other threats that we're aware of, unless other agencies have gotten in specifics outside of LAUSD uh, that this pertains to the threats that we got to our schools only. We do not know any other information about any other threats within the county region at this time. Uh, as I indicated, law enforcement will continue to evaluate the threats. Uh, 
Uh, Chief, would you introduce uh, yeah, the well, chief? Yeah. I would like to introduce uh, Assistant Chief Jorge Villegas, and he is the uh, Assistant Chief from LAPD in charge of Office of Operations. Chief Villegas. Good morning. I'm uh, George Villegas, J O R G E V I L L E G A S. Uh, I'm an assistant chief with the LAPD and the chief of operations. Uh, as was mentioned earlier, uh, the school district received a safety threat uh, that we're in the process now of validating or vetting uh, to determine uh, what, if any, validity it has. Um, as you can imagine, we take all threats seriously. Uh, nothing is more important to us than the safety of our kids, especially those that are uh, coming to and from school that haven't been notified yet of this uh, the safety threat. We're doing everything we can to ensure that we conduct a thorough investigation into that threat, and we'll be working with the school district as well as with the FBI to ensure that uh, the public is informed as much as we can uh, provide as soon as we can provide it. Introduce the board president. This is uh, Steve Zimmer. He's the president of the uh, Los Angeles Board of Education. Can you go over one more? How about we stand up? That was a musical chairs. Sorry, guys. Uh, good morning. Um, uh, my name is Steve Zimmer. Uh, I'm president of the school board of Los Angeles Unified School District. Uh, I'd like to speak, if I could, uh, directly to uh, families uh, and employees. Uh, we are taking this action uh, in an abundance of caution to make sure that every child uh, in LA Unified School District and every employee is absolutely safe. Right now, we ask uh, parents and families, if you have not yet sent your children to school, please do not send them to school. If they have already been dropped off, we will have families uh, meet their children at the reunion gates of all schools. Uh, I want to be very clear. We need the cooperation of the whole of Los Angeles today. We need uh, families and neighbors uh, to work together uh, with our schools and with our employees to make sure our kids are safe throughout the day. We need employers to show the flexibility that a situation like this demands. And we ask you to show the maximum possible flexibility with your employees who are primarily mothers and fathers and guardians today in this situation. Uh, at our school sites, we have asked administrators and uh, plant managers to report we are not, we are asking for teachers and other support personnel uh, to stay home today. Once again, I want to reiterate on behalf of the entire Board of Education, our support for the superintendent, uh, for the chief of police, the actions that we are taking today uh, are swift and they are appropriate given the situation that uh, we are in, uh, and we ask for the patience and the cooperation and support of the city. The education of our kids is incredibly important. Time being at least, a UK military intervention seems unlikely. Why are we doing this outside? I'm just, well, because it's cold and it's starting to rain and we can easily do it from a studio. I'm just wondering what... Yeah, well, that's very easy for you to say in your ivory tower. I'm just wondering, what, really, really? Okay, do you hear what he just said? Do you hear what he, he just said, why don't you, for once in your life, just do the fucking news? All right, no, 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 I'm going to do, no, I'm going to do the fucking news. No, here is the fucking news. 
ex-commercial TV PR man, old Etonian and occasional pig fucker David Cameron would like to bomb Syria. Unfortunately, Russia's got there first and America's been doing it for ages. He wants to bomb Syria to stop the flow of refugees fleeing all the bombs. He's also hoping it will stop the increased influence of Islamic extremism. Bombing Syria will, of course, destroy the one remaining multicultural society in the region, leaving it open to the increased influence of Islamic extremism. To bomb Syria, therefore, is clearly mental. In other news, no, 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 I'm doing, no, I'm doing the, I'm doing the fucking news. In other news, in other news, Muslims are bad, China's bad, but not as bad as it used to be, and Russia is always bad. Nuclear weapons are good, and to suggest not using nuclear weapons is bad. On to the economy. Debt is good. Corrupt banks are bad, but not bad enough for us to do anything about them. And poverty in the UK is a figment of your imagination. On to housing. Jeremy Corbyn's plans to build affordable housing and create social housing for the poorest people in our society is a terrible idea. That's according to multi-millionaire, property magnet and all-round shitpot Sir Alan Sugar. Environmental news, there's nothing to worry about, so please carry on consuming at your usual rate. And finally tonight, entertainment. Matt Damon's intelligent and articulate observations about sexuality in Hollywood means that he is definitely a homophobic twat. My name is Jonathan Pye, and that was the fucking news! Nonpartisan liberty for all. Call in at 702-470-7664 or Skype in. Username, Nonpartisan Liberty for All. Nonpartisan Liberty for All, and we are back. Uh, Vivian is back with us somewhat. <laughs> She's not feeling well at all, but actually took the time to come here, which she lives pretty far, and be on today's show, which she didn't have to do. But that's definitely dedication, and I know she uh, didn't want me to feel like on her first show that, you know, she was just blowing me off or something, so... I feel bad that she she felt bad, but at least uh, I'm I'm trying to help. I gave her a bunch of med- medications, and I do have a couch that the co-hosts and guests sit on, so she's able to lay down on that. So hopefully, she's more comfortable than um, she would be, of course, in like a chair or something. So are you? Are you doing any better over there? I am trying to for you, Dave. I am trying. Okay, well. By next Thursday. (laughs) It's much appreciated, of course. So I came across a Hillary Clinton speech, and this was very recently because she did mention all of these attacks. And this, along with the debate, are two of the scariest things I probably heard in the past couple months. Well, I shouldn't even say that because it's not like I don't know what's going on and it's not like I don't know that they feel this way. What's scary usually for me, and I don't know how you feel, is that people like clap for this shit and they actually buy into it. That's what's scary. Not the fact that they're saying it, but the fact that there's a lot of people that support people like Hillary Clinton or these fucks at the Republican debate and sit there and clap for them. So how do you like, what What are your thoughts on that? How do, how do how does that make you feel, I guess, and is it scary? <coughs> well, I think it's kind of scary because you have people that are, they seem like more like they're rooting for a team, you know, than uh, really understanding what's happening or, or what the views are of people or the fact that they're probably still going to have some of the same, you know, results and outcomes. But you see them cheering, it's almost like it's a, a, a popularity contest on TV like Donald Trump or it's more entertainment value or... You know, you're feeling like you belong to a certain side, which I think labels are pretty ridiculous and used against us. So, 
Yeah, I'd actually done a show on that earlier this week, which kind of broke into the show about uh, people (laughs) talking about me. And then I had to finish it (laughs) the next day. Um, But yeah, I don't agree with labels neither. And I know what you mean as far as rooting for a team. They want to be part of something no matter what it is. But she's not really saying anything different for the most part when it comes to the Republicans. That's what I mean. I mean, they're pretty much the same shit, especially Hillary, who's a supporter of wars and all of this shit. And she was, she headed the state department, which also, uh, you know, I, I don't know how the CIA in their relationship uh, with the state department works, but the state department does a lot of the same shit. And I think they work alongside each other. So, I mean, she was the secretary of state, So, and the whole Benghazi thing, when basically what they did was move weapons from Libya to Syria, and she's talking about some fucking movie, and that's why there, you know, it had happened, because some movie, anti-Islam movie came out, and and then they admitted later that that was their their reason, Um, but... What she did, so you obviously know about the San Bernardino attacks. So what she did was use that as an example to say this can happen anywhere because it didn't happen at the World Trade Center or Disney World or someplace big, someplace that was that's considered important. It just happened in a fucking office building. So now she's coming out and saying that, hey, this could happen anywhere. So it's all part of this whole thing that anybody can be a terrorist and you can get attacked anywhere, anytime. So you should be scared that you should have terrorist drills at your work now. Yeah, and they want you to accept whatever laws are coming after that because, of course, you want to keep yourself safe. You know, they're using our own... uh our own fears against us because, you know, you repeat something enough and people believe it. So. And I think that's kind of how they're um, looking at it in general is let's take everything we can from one event or a couple of events. I mean, they even go back and refer to what happened in France relating that to here. So one of the things that I believe she did, or no, I was watching a video of visas and Congress talk about, you want to talk about uh, exciting videos, Um, Congress talk about visas for, right now there are 38 countries where you can come here and you don't need a visa, but you still need to go through some kind of check. But they had brought up, well, the people in France that committed that attack, they could have gotten to the United States. Okay, fine. But could they have gotten the weapons that they've gotten? Would they be able to pull off what they had pulled off? Would they be able to do any of that? So, I mean, they're kind of, you know distorting the truth there in that um, one was from Belgium and and one was a French national. So because of that, they could have technically went to the U.S. But that doesn't mean that them going to, for, to the U.S. for 30 days, that they're going to be able to uh, find people to buy guns from and set up a plot and all of this shit. It, of course, where they were at, they had lived there. And they had connections to Belgium as well. So it's a different, you know, world over there too. But anything they can use to further their agenda of you need to be scared about terrorism, we need to do something. It's all every time something happens, 
we need to do something. There's never a, well, sometimes things happen and there's nothing you can do about them. So what, what are your, your thoughts on that? Well, as far as, you know, that sometimes things, you know, especially if you're in a so-called free society, which we're not, but that, you know, sometimes things happen. Why does everything that happens have to have a law coming after it? Okay. <laughs> She's a little, little under the weather there. Um, but yeah, I mean, essentially that's, that's like the American way is every time something happens, it has to be reacted to with some kind of law. So, which is... A lot of times the law doesn't have to address the issue. So like, especially with the gun laws they've been trying to pass, it's like they could have passed this, these laws and it wouldn't have stopped any of these uh, incidences that they're talking about. So when you look at the shootings that they were trying to address, it didn't, well, it wouldn't have stopped any of these people from getting a gun. So what is the point? And of course the point is just to slowly take more control because that's what it's about. So she um, immediately, of course, used that, to get that idea in people's heads that you can be attacked anytime, anywhere. Um, the the two things they, they like to get really in people's heads and convince people of is you can be attacked anytime, anywhere, and anybody can be a terrorist. So they go to that, see something, say something, which I even seen at the movies. I mentioned this before. They have a nice commercial at the movies that uh, have this nice little community and have the people talking. We live in this nice little community. And, and and if we were to see something that was unusual, we would, you know, report you to the police like, oh, we see somebody we don't know. Oh, they're dressed suspiciously. Let's... um. Let's call the police. I mean, like the neighbor who can't mind their business, so they're always calling the police. Or the, you know, maybe 0.01% of the time there's actually something that happened that it's a good thing, but 99.9% .9 of the time it's not. And then the police sometimes end up arresting people because they're like, oh, you don't have a good attitude with me, so I'm going to arrest you. And that happens a lot as well. So the other thing that she had mentioned and this is just fucked up in general and i'm sure a lot of people are familiar with the cfr um are you familiar with the with the cfr that sounds familiar but you'd have to tell me something real quick to refresh my memory that okay well there's about three groups that uh are part of, like, the secret groups that they have. And they're, you know, called, like, the groups that rule the world or whatever. Who knows if they do? Who knows if they don't? I think 
I think maybe the people that think that are half right. I, I definitely think they have something to do with it. The CFR is a Council on Foreign Relations. Does that? Yeah, that rings do, oh, okay. Can you say that again? Sorry, I yeah, had that, mic turned that rings a bell. I think that uh, preceded the UN, right? So. Yes, it did. It was, I think, in 1920 it was around. Uh, David Rockefeller, I think, was the head of it for a while. So you have the CFR, the Trilateral Commission. I don't know if you've heard of them. And the, not the Bilderberg Group, but the, um, there's another one. Shit. Or maybe it was the Bilderberg Group I was thinking of. But I think there's another group, too. Essentially, these groups, and the Trilateral Commission is supposed to be China, the U.S., and, um, was it England or something? I don't know. But they essentially, these are where all the millionaires and billionaires get together and discuss government. Now, the Council on Foreign Relations has nothing to do with government, has nobody elected from government. It's like I went and started my own group to talk about government policy government affairs, and things like that. So I feel like I'm missing one, but maybe because there were three, and maybe the third one was the Bilderberg Group, but I thought of that as like a separate entity. But anyway, so Hillary mentioned, and, and most people don't even know this, Hillary mentioned that she had a plan that she uh, showed to the CFR. And I think it had to do with terrorism. I didn't write down what, what, her, what her plan was because it was more important that she showed the CFR. It, and it has to do with uh, getting, uh, getting together with tech companies and all of that stuff to make it so nothing is impenetrable by the government. So essentially you have a group that no one's elected by the people. I mean, they elect their own people and they uh, bring in their own members. Like, like I said, like it would be a group if we formed a group and then we got a bunch of people and we voted in these people and these people. And then it turned into a group of, you know, a couple hundred people. And we discussed government policy and what we think should happen. And we wrote papers on it. And we suggested to the government they should do this and uh, things along those lines. But it, basically geopolitical things and how things with other nations should be handled. But I think... I think it's really anything. Um, I haven't done a lot of research on the CFR other than to know that they talk about issues that pertain to government, but none of them are part of government. And they run themselves and they vote whoever they want in into it. So there was a movie made by, uh, I can't think of his name, but he ran for governor of Nevada actually twice. Um, and he became friends with one of the Rockefellers and he asked him to join the CFR and said that he could vote him in. And, you know, he didn't want to do that. Um, I can picture his face. I can't, uh, think of his name right now but he had talked about the cfr in his uh it was like a documentary it was a documentary originally based on why do we have to pay taxes where's the law that says we have to pay taxes it was called freedom to fascism but he he was also a big uh producer he had produced uh trading places with eddie murphy and dan Aykroyd. I think that was his biggest movie and a bunch of other movies as well. And then in, I think, 98, 
he ran for governor and then he was going to run again as an independent and he ended up dying of cancer. But, and who knows, maybe that has, it, it's, it's just, you never know anymore what to believe. Like maybe he died of cancer because they somehow gave him cancer. I, I, I don't know that there's a way to give somebody cancer because essentially it's just manipulating your cells. Anyway, he talked about the CFR and how it's, you know, basically just a private organization that, you know, they just operate like anybody else. And you have Hillary laying out a plan for them. Sounds kind of fucked up. So these are one of those groups like the Bilderberg Group and Trilateral Commission that supposedly, you know, run run the world or the people that uh, contribute to government, I you know, through ideas and things like that that have nothing to do with it. So it's it, the fucked up part is that you have a presidential candidate saying that she did this and you know it's no big deal. Now to me wouldn't that be like sharing your plan with you know, any regular person, you know, that has some fucking group, you know, sharing your plan with the, what's the difference between them and the local tea party? You know, there really isn't one. So I'm actually going to try to look up if I'm missing one here, because I know there was three, but I thought there was three and the Bilderberg group. So I'm sure it will give me the, uh, no, I guess that's it. And you can get a list of their members. And it's funny because all of the, both Bill Clinton and Jimmy Carter, two unknown governors for the from the South, were members of the Trilateral Commission. And that was formed by uh, Rockefeller, I believe. Yeah, David Rockefeller in the 70s. So I actually read a book on his autobiography. And in uh, a lot of it, it totally, you can see uh, how he's that type of person. And you know, that would totally fit in with that. But yeah, it's so it's the CFR, the Bilderberg Group, and the Trilateral Commission. So um, she lays out these plans. And the other thing, there's a couple things she mentioned, and we'll go through those. But The plans I think that she laid out was, as I mentioned before, and I'm sure you heard of this, that Apple developed an iPhone that they supposedly say that it can't be uh, hacked. It's encrypted to the point where the government can't hack it. Have you? I haven't heard of that, but I, I don't think I would believe that. And other uh, companies, I believe, have done it as well. Not Maybe hack's not the right word, but it's encrypted where you might have to do something first. Like, I don't think it's just if you do a regular phone call or a regular right. uh, text or something like that, that you probably have to use special software and the other person might have to have it on their phone. Like, have you ever heard of Tech Secure? 
Sure, yeah. So, like, text secure, you have to have it on your phone, and I would have to have it on my phone and text you that way through text secure. So it might be something like that. But supposedly there's encryption uh, that they're creating a... I don't know if it was a phone or maybe an iPad or something like that, that the government couldn't, there's no back door for the government, that they can't get into it. Uh, I, th- I think I want to hear stories like that. It almost seems like they're setting a trap up. Yeah, they, I, I you know. think that as well, yeah. that it's hard to believe that Apple would do that because you know that most of these companies are in with the government. Sure. But... Let's just say it is true. And either way, um, there are groups out there that have the this technology background that do fight for freedom like Anonymous or whatever. Right. So she wants to work with the tech companies to get them to help to get into this technology and to make sure that there's nothing with back doors and there's nothing that the government cannot access. Because I remember when the, it came out and you had the director of the FBI flipping out saying that, you know, this shouldn't... You now think about this for a minute. This is supposed to be a free country, supposedly, and you have the director of the FBI having a fit because he can't secretly access your phone. Yeah, it's just, uh, it, it seems even distracting. The, the whole point is that why are we even talking about that? Why is that even, you know, an issue? Or why are they trying to figure it out or not trying to figure it out? Or, you know, they're putting something on the table that we shouldn't even have on the table. They should not be spying on every person and everything we do. And, you know, but, but it seems like a trap too. Like, go ahead and text away. Yeah, you know, WikiLeaks when that came out, and you know, uh, what's his name, Assange, and the history on him was suspicious when I read about him a little bit. You know, and then he takes off to some country, and there's all this, you know, controversy around him and drama, and it just seemed like it was another distraction or a way to say, hey, you know, trust us, send what you want here, so we can see more about you because they already know that people are thinking they they don't want you to have any way to run, anywhere to fight back. You know, your your right to bear arms is, is specifically against the government's tyranny. And they'll tell you, you know, we don't need guns like this to go hunting. It's not about hunting in the first place. So, you know, they change definitions or they change meanings of what were actually how things were written and why they were written. I mean, I think if the Constitution was written today, we would be armed with tanks and we would be armed with, you know, yeah, because M-16s and, and F-16s. It, and, no, I agree that it would be... Uh, essentially, you should have at a minimum at least anything the police have. You should have. That's yeah, at a, that's at a minimum. As far as the military, I don't believe there should be a military, and and neither did they, because <coughs> even even Japan said that uh, their their whole thing was behind every blade of grass there'd be a gun. So they didn't invade the U.S. because everybody was armed. And the whole idea, even in the Constitution, was we're going to have, you know, everybody's going to have the right to be armed. We don't need a standing army because, you know, we have a militia. We have everybody that's armed. So if we're attacked, because I would even say that right now that, if the U.S. was attacked or if Las Vegas was attacked, that I would be out there shooting at them. And I would never join the military, and I could care less about the government. But as far as the people of Las Vegas, I would be out there helping to fight back. And that is the whole point, is that the only reason that the U.S. has an army like they do, and they have the biggest army in the world. They have like almost 200 bases or something. They're essentially occupying all these other countries because the countries are probably too scared to say no. They're going to say no to the U.S. Unless it's a country that has nuclear weapons that they could fire upon the U.S., they're going to say yeah. Yeah, I agree. 
we have nuclear weapons that we could fire upon somebody. And it's kind of, you know, who says who's right and who says who's supposed to be in the authority and, and the the ringman of that, you know? It's well, like, I don't have them, but the U.S. government yeah. has them. Yeah, I, I, I know you said Over we. here. and <laughs> not, not we, dude. You said we. We no. should have them. But, but, no. um, but yeah, if you notice, um, the U.S. government doesn't – do a lot when it comes to other countries that have nuclear weapons. They stay away from them. But countries that don't, those are the ones that they can intimidate. So, like, the U.S. is not going to get a base in China. They're not going to get a base in Russia because they can't intimidate them. But they can get a base in Japan. They can get a base in probably Italy or Spain, or Portugal. I don't know if any of those countries have nuclear weapons. Um, England, uh, they that would be up to their friendship with England, but, you know, England wouldn't do it out of fear because they have uh, enough weapons to take care of themselves. Canada, you know, I don't know why they'd need a base in Canada. It's right there. But what I mean is a lot of these countries that they have bases in, they can intimidate them into letting them put bases in them. Intimidate, bribe, you know, either way. Well, I mean, yeah, I mean, they can bribe them as well. But I think part of it, depending on the country, it might be intimidation. It might be, you know, hey, we want to put a base here, you know, and the country might be scared to say no. It all depends on the country. Yeah, I agree. So, I mean, and why do they need bases all over the fucking country, all over the uh, world? It's it's insane. When you start getting into some of this stuff, like I had said earlier, I don't know if, if you had heard this, that if you take, so you take the amount of money that the U.S. spends on the military, and then you take you rank uh, by dollar amount. So U.S. is number one. Take two through eleven and add them together, and it's still less than the total the U.S. spends on the military. Yeah, it's an overkill, and like you say, probably a, a, a fear tactic in the eyes of leaders, or you know, and leaders see what happens to other leaders that buck the system. You know, Gaddafi wanted to. Uh, try to get people selling oil through his, you know, through Africa based on gold, yeah. you know, so it, it's, it's pretty easy to intimidate somebody when they can see that anybody that bucks, you know, the U S or it's little puppet, the UN, you know, gets uh, a situation they don't want to deal with usually. So. Yeah. And I, I think it's, it's insanity that you have them, you have these people, <laughs> these Republicans that supposedly want less government, right? They want to spend more money on the military. It's already over 50% of the budget. Now, the only person who had actually came out and said we need to cut the military too was Rand Paul. Um, now, I don't think he'd ever get elected because if you can't control him, you know, the whole thing's rigged and they wouldn't, they'd never put him in power unless they can control him. Because for them, that would actually be the best situation if they could control him. Because they could show, oh, look, we're, look, somebody got elected that, you know, is a little libertarian, um, not a lot. He's not like his dad. But because really, if you look at when Bush uh, got out of office, People were 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 angry. People were ready to fucking, you know, start a revolution. Then you had so Obama got in and they're in they're all happy. And then you have the same people that criticize Bush for the things he did. Obama do, goes and does the same thing and they don't say nothing. So it was almost the perfect fit for the powers that be. To put Obama in there because it's like now they have somebody that even the people that don't support some of the things he's doing aren't going to question him. There are some that did, but 
there are still plenty that don't. Yeah, then, you know, you have people are looking for something different from what happened and all they need is one trigger word change. And, you know, everybody rallies around it because everybody wants that. It doesn't matter what side you're on, if you're labeling yourself or not. Everybody sees that things aren't going in a positive direction for this country, you know, and of course you want change. So he runs around with his little motto, change, and yes, we can. And everybody just excited because, yeah, that's how simplistic and vague. Of course we want change. Well, essentially, I think the, the agenda was already established. It's like it's like this. It's like, you know, the races where you get a baton and you pass it to the next person. Yeah. That That's what it is. And whoever the next person is, they're just passing the baton. Now, who it is, it's just a matter of who would be the best person that would get the people to go along with things that we could, that would still push our agenda. That's how I look at it. So like Trump, if they could, if he would push their agenda and it sounds like he's all for it. He's talking about making lists of Muslims. He's talking about increasing the military. Uh, He's talking about all of these things He talked about uh, not caring about freedom of speech. He said the people that care about freedom of speech, um, they're stupid. I actually have, let me find the clip. I played it earlier, but um, I just want to play the beginning where he says that. I'm Eric Bowling in for Bill O'Reilly, and we continue with this special edition of the O'Reilly Factor, the war on terror, the political equation. In the 2016 segment tonight, do any of the presidential candidates have a real strategy to win the war on Islamic terror? We just heard from Donald Trump defend his plan to temporarily ban Muslims from entering the country. He also wants to police the Internet. We have to go see Bill Gates and a lot of different people that really understand what's happening. We have to talk to them, maybe in certain areas, closing that internet up in some way. Somebody will say, oh, freedom of speech, freedom of speech. These are foolish people. We have a lot of foolish people. We have a lot of foolish people. We've got to maybe do something with the internet because they are recruiting by the thousands. Joining us now from New Hampshire, Kentucky State. So that was... uh Donald Trump talking about that. I have to adjust a microphone real quick, so please bear with me. We have a microphone uh, that doesn't fit as nicely on the table as I would like. That's what I was talking about, worrying about maybe coming off. If you could just hold the, the part of the new unit, like something like that. So I'm trying to talk loud here. Hopefully people can hear me because I have your mic turned down. Um, We just had a microphone uh, adjustment to the table issue. And there we go. Let me hold that down and let's do this. Okay, sorry about that. I just wanted to play the clip where Trump really says... Uh, basically says free speech. What you know? What moron cares about free speech? I mean, <laughs> this is a guy who's out of his fucking mind, and he'd be perfect probably if they could control him. But um, let me get back on track here because uh, we have to end the show uh, soon. Um, as I had mentioned, uh. She's uh, still under the weather and and sick, and I have to get uh, end the show by 11 at the latest. So I want to get through a couple more things, though. I just need to make sure that I don't get uh, sidetracked here. So Hillary uh, said they need to work with the tech companies, essentially, as we talked about the phones, and basically they don't. The the U.S. government believes that they should be able to access any of your electronic devices no matter what. You can't put anything on them to stop them. 
where you can, but it sounds like they want to make it illegal. She also added the same thing Obama did about the list. If you're on the terrorist list, you shouldn't be able to uh, own a gun. Now the or the no fly list. Now the no fly list is basically no due process. They just write your name on a list. So if they're like, hey, we don't want you to have a gun, they just put your name on the list, which is insane. But people are buying into this. This is what is scary. People are saying, yeah, let's do that. So that's a serious, to me, uh, serious issue. Like, what if they put your name on a list and said, hey, you can't have a gun? And you're like, well, what did I do? I didn't do anything. I think they're making it a way to where, you know, eventually with with enough you know laws and statutes and uh, ways to assess people mentally. And I think they'll make it to where there's nobody that they couldn't in some way uh, lock down on the list or prevent from speaking or and definitely detain them based on quote unquote terrorism. You know, uh, it just seems like they're just putting nets everywhere. They want to net in every possible road that you can walk down. And just in case they want to grab you and pull you off the little mission yeah, that you're it's, on. It's about control. That's exactly what it's about. They want to be able to control things. And some people are too stupid. Don't they put two and two together and say, wait a minute, this list, it doesn't go through a court. It doesn't go through anything. Not that it would matter because warrants, basically judges just sign off on warrants like it's nothing anyway. But you don't get a chance to say what crimes are being charged against me. Well, nothing. Because if you're on the list, you don't even have a crime charge against you. So. So why sh- why should you be on a no fly list even? Uh, you know, it, it, it's all a mind control game. It's a way to enforce the lie and to make it seem so much more real than it is. And I think to keep us from traveling, I, I strongly believe that the TSA is in the airports just so they can see how much money you're carrying. I really don't think they they've not thwarted anything. You know, there's nothing that they've done for us except cause more hassle and now they can see how much money you're traveling with because of that strip that's in your dollar and i think that's a big thing they don't want money being transferred around they don't want you to protect yourself if it ever came down to something big in this government and they definitely don't want you to be able to run and hide and share information without them knowing what you're doing oh all your money should be in a safe deposit box not in the not in, and not one at a bank and you should also have money in gold and silver i unfortunately sold all my gold and silver and i need to buy more but you shouldn't have any money in a bank because in in the Frank uh, Dodd Frank law, from what I understand, next time they're doing a bail in. Do you know? Are you familiar with a bail in? Uh, no, the bail out I was familiar with, but the bail in, no. The bail in means you bail your money in, so the banks take all the money first of the people that deposited the money in the bank. So. I don't know, like, what will be the cutoff. They did it in Cyprus, um, that island off the coast of Greece. So, essentially, keeping your money in a bank, if you have a lot of money, is not a good idea. I know they have secret deposit boxes that you can either do a retinal scan or they just give you the key, and it's not registered under any name you just pay them and they don't know who you are i mean even with that the dmv they're starting to get to where they're going to be doing you know identification that's a lot more uh, invasive to us like you know probably retina scan i'm sure that's all coming around the corner i mean they're already talking about it and you know now there's a card that we can get at the dmv and i think it's starting you know this year or next year you can use it as a passport because you're going to need it just to fly internationally oh yeah they uh, they talked about that um At that meeting I had listened to for Congress about when I was just talking about visas and stuff like that, that they want, uh, I don't know if I have it written down, but they wanted like a visa with a, uh, yeah, I do, machine readable passports with biometrics um, and... It's probably going to be that's for people coming into the country, but it's probably going to be 
what they use for U.S. passports too. So meaning biometrics. I mean, they have these machines that can tell, like, even if you're disguised, they can tell who you are by the way you walk and the way you, like, your movements and things like that. It's it's scary. And New York is, I think, in the U.S. is the biggest surveillance city where they have control of all these cameras and all this shit. But London is the biggest in the world, where essentially everywhere you are, you probably have a camera on you. It makes me wonder if the crime rates drop down to zero or not. And if not, then, you know, it does, something no. is obviously not necessary. It's, you know, not there for the reason they say it's there for. It's definitely not. It's, again, it's it's control. It, it's... And it's getting to the point where it's going to be too late. And that's why earlier I had mentioned noncompliance, and I, I mentioned hypothetically. So I think the only answer is noncompliance because think about this. So you want to change a law. One, you may have to help somebody with a campaign and then go through that whole thing. But maybe you don't there's somebody that way you know them and say they say that they'll submit your bill whatever but say you don't know them you got to find somebody that's going to actually submit your bill try it. good luck with that then you have to find somebody not find somebody you have that person but they have to get it through committee they have to get it through all these processes I mean, the percentage of bills that become laws are so small that it it it's ridiculous. And we're talking about things here. We're not talking about murder or rape or robbery or even damaging somebody's property. We're talking about things that don't directly interfere with other people's lives, things that essentially have no standing. it has no standing in the court it, not, all the it, things you're mentioning should. shouldn't have any standing in the court of law well one one amend, amendment that has never is never brought up i've never heard it brought up i heard it brought up once i think but they didn't really go into it are, are you familiar with the ninth amendment probably not because i wasn't neither so don't don't feel bad i never knew what the ninth amendment was neither because they don't want you to know and they don't teach it in school. And uh, and I don't remember them even going over it in school. What it says is, though, is that essentially if we didn't write in here explicitly that you can't do do this, then you can. It's, it's saying uh, – I'm, maybe I'm wording it wrong. It's saying just because we didn't say you can't do something doesn't mean you can't. So essentially, I would like some, to see somebody use that as a defense to a drug case to say, well, because to me, that's exactly what it says is, is the Ninth Amendment might as well say um, what we say. And as far as as long as you're not directly hurting anybody else, you can do whatever you want. That's kind of what it says to me. And. Now, I know a judge would probably say whatever, and that's bullshit, and throw the case out. Not throw it out, but throw out that whatever I said regarding the Ninth Amendment. But why do you think they would add that if it wasn't to protect your rights? Oh, I mean, they knew from how long ago. It's never been, it's never changed. You can go back to the medieval days and they told, you know, the people in the towns, there's a dragon around the corner. I mean, so this is something that's been going on as far back as we've been here. And, you know, everybody who wrote that constitution and was involved in that, they knew, they knew what you're up against. You know, powers are going to always be abused and it's something that has to constantly and vigilantly be watched. You know? What do you, yeah, and definitely that's, that's a good point that even no matter what, you got to main you have to maintain something so what people did at some point and i don't know what that point is it might have been right away is say hey we have freedom now 
It's there. It's We don't have to do anything about it. And definitely, since I've been alive, that's what people have done. Nobody have, I mean, there's people here and there, but in general, people didn't make sure, hey, we can't just uh, say we have freedom, we've accomplished this, and let it go. We have to constantly watch it and make sure that it it stays there. So what were you going to say? Sorry, I didn't. I was just going to say and how beautiful and, and how difficult it must have been for a group of people to sit there and say, how are we going to word this in a way that it's going to carry on for generations and not be misconstrued? And it's not going to be. And it was immediately. Yeah. I mean, you had the, the whiskey <clears throat> rebellion, you know, when Washington sent, you know, troops down there and they had just fought in the revolution. So what would be your. I guess solution or I mean it's a complicated question but what do you think we as a people or uh, what what do you think the answer is to save any of this freedom I mean pretty much it's just a level of freedom different places have a bigger level of freedom you know I think Nevada has a higher level of freedom than a lot of states. Um, so it's just levels of freedom. There's no place that's free. The world has been taken over by governments. There's nowhere to go. What do you think people should do or what, you know, to to try to reverse any of this? And, of course, every time the other thing is, like, I talked about a bill. So while you're trying to put that bill through, right, they have just passed all these other bills and put you even further behind. So you're not only fighting for, you know, 200 years worth of bad government is you're trying to stop the current stuff. And I mean, it, it's what, what do you do? Do you just say, you know, fuck it, I'll wait until it gets really bad, and if the police come to my house, I'll just fucking shoot them? Like, what do you... I'm just saying that, hypothetically, that was just an example of in the future. Um, do you just, you know, stock up on stuff and just wait and then go off the grid? What? That's suspicious to be at, at Sage. So if you're stocking up on anything, even diapers, you're a very suspicious person to your government. Well, no, yeah. but nobody knows. Yeah, I. Well, actually, they do if they want to because of the cards or whatever. But, but yeah, I mean, you can. There's so many people that are doing it. You can, you know. It's almost like if you know, uh, it's hard to manage more. I think that if we were in smaller, uh, you know, like the Indian, smaller groups of people governing ourselves, and you know, the leaders of the different areas talking amongst each other and having an understanding that was a little more. Uh, peaceful and rational i states governing themselves even that which should be happening and it's not because you got the feds coming in and you know changing things the states saying right. arresting people even that like how big is it's that? still too big because yeah. that's the whole thing is when the country was started you had like six million people now you have 300 million the country is too big to be ruled to have a federal government essentially ruling over that many people but either way if you have a hundred thousand people Unless every single person agrees to a law that violates their personal freedoms, I, I I would say it's unfair, you know, besides the ones that hurt other people. So, like the drug laws, I think every drug law is unfair unless every person in that given area, and that wouldn't work anyway because then you have kids that are born and – you know, I guess they could leave the, the area, but it, it, it's, I, I don't know. So what, like if you, I mean, right now you're kind of just, you know, doing the same thing I'm doing. Actually, exactly right now mm -hmm. <laughs> is being on the radio. But what, you know, because I'm not really doing anything neither besides being on the radio trying to change people's minds but it even though it's gotten pretty bad 
I don't know that it's gotten to the point of no return, but it's getting close to that. So what, you know, what do you think about or what, you know, are your answers to that? I mean, would you say, hey, fuck this, I'm going to go try to get off the grid somewhere and, and get away from all this and try to, I mean, that's even hard to do in itself. A friend that went uh, from the UK over to Spain, and he bought himself a little piece of land, and he's built everything up himself. And there was, you know, I think almond trees, and he's got ways he's barely skating by. He's gone to Germany once in the last year for work to make money. It's not easy, you know. I think that it sounds like a really good idea, but at the same time, what timeline is it going to be to where they're going to come take that from you? And you might not even know because you're just so off the grid, and you're kind of. I think eventually, you know, like you say, it's a point of no return, but I think almost anywhere you put yourself in our history, you might feel that way. You go back to, you know, Henry David Thoreau, and in the 1800s, he wrote Civil Disobedience, and it's a great essay, and he starts off that, I heartily accept the motto that government is best which governs least. And I should like to see it acted to more systematically and rapidly. I mean, people have been, since the Constitution was written, realizing that somebody's going to encroach on that and they're going to take it for their own, you know, agendas and advantage of us. And it's not uh, a good situation that we're in right now. Well, I mean, it's just a piece of paper. It's not magic. It's not going to magically stop people from not breaking it. And that's where I had said to you off air as well that once you give people power over you, they're going to do what they want with that power. Yeah. So, you know, I, I don't believe in a revolution where people overthrow the government. I think that's just stupid. And if you don't have the hearts and minds of people, I mean, this would be my perfect scenario, that you get the majority of people to really understand what government is and what it's about. And they stop obeying the laws that they shouldn't be obeying anymore. And they uh, essentially, it dissolves itself because nobody listens anymore. They just say, you know, forget it. We're not following these and there's too many people to stop. What are they going to do? Gun down everybody? Right. So, I mean, that that's like a perfect situation. I don't see that happening, unfortunately. So it's more of how many people can you get to understand the truth? Because this is not like some bullshit or, you know, I, I know some people can maybe debate some of the things that I'm saying, definitely. But the fact that the government uh, extorts money from you without your consent is a fact. You don't consent to this. And they violate your rights. The police kidnap you because somebody putting what they want in their body. If a cop grabs somebody off the street, that's kidnapping as far as I'm concerned. That's why in my mind, every cop is a bad cop because you kidnap people. So you might not be bad in a, as a person, but you're bad in your job. You're kidnapping people. You're, you're agreeing to kidnap people. Unfortunately, I think that, you know, I agree with your statements, but there's so many people that are going to say, they're learning from a different definition. And so, you know, there's a wall up of, of misunderstanding or ignorance or you're insane for believing what you do because the definition they grew up with, they never had any reason to question it. And they, they first hear it from people that seem maybe a little fanatical or bring up other subjects involved with that. And I think for most people, just too overwhelming and they just don't want to understand the definition that you're that you're looking at, which, you know, uh, if you're a thinker and, and you have any kind of logic in your head and you took a step back and just zoomed out a few you would see that something's wrong and that they're not supposed to do what they're doing. But should they get a pass? Because if you look at now, I mean, all this information is on the Internet. Um, it's not hard to find like it used to be. And if you look into it, you can de I, I and I know completely what you're saying. And people have been brainwashed and all of that. 
But I don't know that people should get, I mean, at what point are people responsible for their actions in that, you know, you're, you're violating somebody's rights, whether it's a law or not. At what point do you hold people responsible? Years ago, I would have said, well, before the internet, it was a lot harder because you didn't have that information at your fingertips like you have now. But at what point do you start holding people responsible? You have people at Hillary Clinton rallies clapping when she says that people shouldn't be able to uh, have technology that the government can't access. Or when Trump says that people are morons that believe in freedom of speech. Uh, you know, like like you were talking about earlier, just, you know, noncompliance. I usually use the metaphor of like a football stadium and, you know, they have everybody cheering for one side or the other. And then you've got the, the wild card like a Donald Trump that keeps you entertained. And their biggest fear, I mean, from Ronald Reagan to Donald Trump to just uh, making a joke about our voting system as it is just to our face. I mean, just a joke like we're going to throw an actor in here or some guy that says you're fired to people. So it's such an entertainment value and factor. Their biggest fear, they're yeah, getting fired. desperate. It's desperate. I mean, you know, it wasn't enough to have the two teams. People are starting to wake up. So here's some more entertainment. Just please don't walk out of the stadium. They're desperate. You're going to walk out. And then you got you got this fuck who's a doctor um, who says he wants to amp up the war on drugs. Uh, I can't think of his name. The, the black guy. I, I, I feel bad saying the black guy, but um, that's how uh, doc, the doctor, Dr. Not Doctor Cummings, is it? I know you're talking about, but I can't. Yeah. Well, let let me get back to this and and finish this up real quick because we don't have uh, that much time, and I know you're sick and probably want to get home and get to bed. So I think everybody out there should should give uh, Vivian a lot of credit for taking the time to come do the show with us and showing that dedication. So um, hopefully she will continue to not come sick, but to want to do the show and enjoy uh, being here. If if it wasn't for you being sick, do, do you think you uh, would be enjoying your your time here? <laughs> I have enjoyed the conversation. It's nice. It's unfortunate. You know, I woke up sick and with a stiff neck, I can't even turn. So I've got like a couple things going at once. But regardless, I think the topics are all interesting to me. And they're things that I like to ramble about and talk about. You know, none of us are as smart as the all of us. So it's important that we all throw our two cents in and share information. It's important. I really believe it's very important. No, definitely. And and I'm glad that uh, besides, you know, the being sick that that you've enjoyed it so far and, and hopefully, um, you know, you will continue to and and you'll be here for a long time and and hopefully we'll start making money at some point and uh, and. And I like to say one other thing, too, that was reminded to me by you. You were talking about the baton. And when I was a child, my parents would have meetings. Like you say, there was no Internet. And they would have, you know, videos they put in of people giving a lecture about something. And they'd have friends over and they'd all talk about it and listen in books and audio cassette tapes they would listen to. And, you know, as I got older and I started listening to all this stuff, I'm like, hey, Dad, I'm sorry. I never believed you when I was younger. And, oh, my gosh, this and that. And he's like, oh, you know, Vivian, you got to let it go. It's going to drive you crazy because you're not going to change anything. I said, no, no. I was like, it's okay that you're tired, but you gave me a baton, and I'm going to run as far as I can. And hopefully my daughter or somebody else will take that baton and keep running with it. I think it's important just to keep keep talking and keep getting information. Does, does she believe in a lot of this stuff? Um, you know, she's like me and my... I, I got married early and I started really early. So I think it kind of put me yeah. in a different perspective that she might be there in a few years, but she questions things. And sometimes she's like, mom, I heard this on when the Coney thing first came out. She's like, mom, as soon as I saw this and everybody was posting on Facebook, I knew it was probably just some bull crap. And I'm like, I'm proud of you. She didn't do much research, but she was aware and, and able to see that there's something going on. How did this jump on all of a sudden? Everybody's talking about it. And what's the purpose? You know, does she know that um, you're doing the show? Yeah, but I'm not sure she's listening because she, she was she, sick before me. So. She could always listen to the archives. So <coughs> true. You can let her know where the archives are, so she she can listen to those. So I'm I'm gonna uh, go through this, and we only got about twenty minutes. 
and please uh, chime in when uh, if you got something to add. So I guess where we left off was at the end of Hillary. Um, she also talked about social media postings that they should be reviewing those. They've been doing that anyway, so I don't know what the fuck she's talking about. It's kind of like just to mention this real quick that when I was talking about the Republicans in the debate, they acted like that things hadn't been hadn't changed. So like Assad wasn't the one who released the chemical weapons, but they acted like he was. And they just said about the metadata that they're only taking metadata. And of course, after Edward Snowden, we know that that's not true. It's like they're going back to that, thinking that people uh, either don't know or will just believe them. And, And I think it's true that they probably will. No, I agree with you. Of course, why not? You repeat something enough and people just believe what they've heard a few times. They don't. Most people don't have the time or don't care to have the time to research it themselves. And, 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 and that's uh, sad. So um, and then she got into what we pretty much talked about, the need for tech companies to work with the government. So she doesn't only want them to not uh, create things that have encryption that they can't break which is getting easy and e- easier for them to do as far as, you know, with encryption, like the algorithms and whatever. Encryption is getting mu- much more sophisticated where it's really getting harder and harder to crack from what I understand. And I'm, I, I don't know a lot about that. But so she wants to get the tech companies to work with the government. Uh, a lot of them have been anyway. So and she said, we elect the president to keep us safe. Bitch, I don't fucking need you to keep me safe. And, of course, feminists would think, you know, that I'm being uh, whatever because I said bitch. But, you know, I can keep myself safe. I don't need the police. I don't need the government to keep me safe. But thank you for the offer. But I don't have I don't have a, you know, like I can't go over to a security company and say, you know what, police, I don't want you. I want the security company, not for me, but to protect my fiance and my animals in my house. Besides, and when I'm not home, make sure people don't break in. Besides that, I don't fucking need you. But no, they have a monopoly on force. And in their monopoly on force, you can't get rid of them. They're, they're, that's why they have such poor customer service and treat people like shit because they know that they're guaranteed a job. So she also talked about her support for police, of course, and how great they are. And she talked about the shooting in San Bernardino and how the police, you know, showed up and saved everybody, which was bullshit because the, they were gone when the police came. So, you know, and the guy says, I would take a bullet before you. But I I saw the video and it sounded like what he meant was he was standing in front of them so he would take a bullet before them. Not that he would literally like jump in front, I don't know, whatever. So, you know, the government, of course, claims to protect people. You know, Congress claims to protect people, the president. But who protects you from the government? Because nobody does. And the police don't protect shit. They show up after the fact. Not during. If it's during, it's just, you know, luck. It's like they want you to wait. They want to take your guns away. And you wait for the police while you're being murdered. And then when they get there, they can investigate the fucking crime scene. Then you have, uh, we played the clip about what happened in L.A., which I still don't totally understand, but they closed over a 1,000 schools in L.A. over what I understand to be a bomb threat, and they searched, I guess, uh, all those schools. 640,000 students... And they're, you know, they're conditioning kids that the police state is necessary and they're going to add more officers. Did you have police in your school growing up? Because I did not. Yeah, my first day of high school here, uh, El Dorado. And uh, 
somebody was shot and killed in the cafeteria my first day of school. Ooh. So right away they put in, you know, well, that's, uh, uh, metal detectors and... So yeah. was that a result of what happened, or did they have them beforehand? Oh, that was a result of what happened immediately after they installed metal detectors. In yeah, the I think that's a terrible way to react to, you know, I, I understand something like that happening, but that's it's, what I'm talking about with the reaction. Like, Or you could stab another child with a, a sharpened pencil. I mean, you're not really resolving the problem. Like another metaphor I like is, you know, pruning a tree. Do we really want to keep pruning a tree to go the wrong way? Because that's all we're doing. We're pruning it for them. Yeah, because you're not getting to the root of the problem. Yeah. It should be up, uplifted and uprooted and thrown away and thought about, you know, a little better. But So, yeah, I think that's definitely a mistake, like right away. Okay, well, this happened, so... Metal detectors were solved a problem, not the fact that, you know, some kids are nuts and we need to deal with why, why did this take place in the first place um, type of thing. So uh, that's crazy. I didn't know you went to high school here. Did, did you, did you grow up here? Were you yeah. born in? Born and raised here. So um, they're adding more police. I didn't have police. Uh, at my school growing up and most people during that time didn't that was probably one of the exceptions did they have police before the shooting yeah we had uh two officers that would walk around you know one was my softball coach and the other one they were both metro and that was before mm -hmm. the the yeah, shooting they were always there apparently yeah um i don't know how long always is but before i got well there. i mean yeah when you since you had been there they were they were there we had police come to the school which I thought was fucked up, uh, even having them come there with dogs sometimes. And they would, you know, um, I don't know, sniff for drugs or whatever, but they weren't, like, always there. But I think that is, you know, creates a totally fucked up environment. And I don't know if you've been following all the kids that have been arrested uh, at school for stupid shit. Um. Oh, I, yeah, children. I, yeah, I, I mean, yeah, you have elementary school kids getting yeah. arrested, but I, I remember one off the top of my head that there was an 18-year-old arrested because he had, like, a first aid thing. I guess he was working to become an EMT, and he had his EMT kit in his car, and it had, like, a knife in it, and he got charged with something that he could have went to jail for 10 years for. And just conditioning children. It's ridiculous. Like you look at California and that every single child won't forget that incident. That's, you know, like I say, I don't believe in protests because, and you know, in my opinion, it's kind of giving them the authority. You're saying that I, I acknowledge your authority and here I'm going to stand here and tell you I don't like it. So the only reason I told you I went to yeah. the one protest, my daughter's developing years, I wanted her to see something from a very, very young age. It's the only reason I went, but you know. Well, my, my issue is that I, I don't believe it really does much. Because unless it's covered by the news, which usually anything that has to do with uh, freedom is not, um, unless it gets that coverage, no one's really going to hear about it. You have people that drive by and honk or whatever, so maybe they might have their kids in the car and they might have a conversation. But the whole point is to get out the message. And, you know, people that do protest, that's fine. I don't criticize people for what they do. If you want to go do this and get involved in politics, that's fine. If you want to do that, whatever. To me, I think the only solution is noncompliance, and that's it. And that's what I believe. That and, of course, educating people and getting them, because you have to get people to a point where they want to noncomply, and that's by really telling them the truth about things. And that's the one thing and I, I think the one reason why the government is scared um, is because we have the truth on our side. And that's a fact, you know, as far as what the government is. Now, it might not be with every little thing, like some is speculation. But you can even look at classified documents and see all the things they did, like MK Ultra, where they did the brainwashing, yeah. where the uh, I had told you about the the guy cia guy who raped college women that they were uh putting into hypnosis and they were doing it so they could create 
uh, assassins. I mean, all this is documented stuff. So I think that's what happened with Sirhan Sirhan, who killed uh, Robert Kennedy, because he claims he had no recollection of anything that happened. So, um, and I have information about Oklahoma City because I talked to one of the guys um, about it that was in the militia movement at the time. And even PBS had a documented thing that said that, uh, what's his name who did it? Um, Lee Harvey Oswald. No, (laughs) it's a guy who who got framed for the Patsy for Kennedy. Um, I can't think of his name, but that he went to his house and called him and whatever. And what the the reason you he knows that they obviously lied is because he's a junior and they went to his father's house. They claim they went to his father's house and that his father called them and he was staying with his sister. So uh that's Timothy McVeigh. Okay. Yeah. And the other guy, uh I forget his name, but but yeah, they have Timothy McVeigh coming to his house and all this shit, which never happened. So he thinks that maybe they were trying to frame him too because he was part of the militia movement back then. And I, I've had him on uh, the show. The last time I was ha- supposed to have him on the show, it was supposed to be to talk about it in detail, and he never called in. And I don't know if that was for a reason or not, but he does have an interview out there where he talks about a lot of it. Um, So he talked about the bomb threats. And that's another, they're doing school lockdowns, even in Las Vegas, like once a week, they'll lock down an elementary school, get the kids used to living in a police state, um, show them SWAT teams. My friend's son had uh, the SWAT team come and talk to the class. Of course, they, they tell him a different story because my story about the SWAT team would be when uh, a, a roommate called the police on his roommate because he thought he was going to hurt himself. So he had a gun and he thought he was going to hurt himself. So he called the police. The SWAT team sniper actually shot him and killed him. So if you want to get somebody killed that you think, uh, well, whether you think whatever, call the police and they'll probably shoot them for you. Tell them they're depressed. And, um, you know, and, and, of course, they claim he pointed it towards them or something like that. And it's it's such bullshit. I, I don't believe, you know, 99.9% of the time that even if somebody, and he probably didn't, that's just what they're going to say. But, I mean, he was probably holding it, just pointing it, and it just, you know, if you got a whole bunch of police, he probably wasn't, like, pointing it at anybody specific. Uh, but they, um, it's just such uh, bullshit. I mean, they'll say, uh, whatever they want to defend what they do and you can't believe them. And there was another guy, which you, I never heard it about it, uh, about him again. He was walking on, I think two fifteen with a shotgun yeah, and they never said what happened. They just said that they, they killed him because his car could have broke down. He could have had a shotgun in his car and been carrying it. They never released anything again about it. I thought I had heard that he, and, and I don't know, you know, who knows what the truth was, but that he had pointed it towards an officer. The officer got scared, backs up his patrol car instead of pursuing him, and then other officers came in to shoot him, but I'm not quite sure how. Yeah, but I never heard like what the full investigation sure. was. So that might have been it. Um, but yeah, I I was checking on that too. Um, so I talked about the machine readable passports with biometrics, and then a question I asked. I mean, what damage can ISIS or other Islamic terrorists do in the U.S. anyway? First of all, I think they can do stuff, but they need help from the FBI, the CIA. And there's really only three terror, now three 
so-called terrorist uh, incidents that had happened. And I think they all had help from the CIA or the FBI. They all were, in, well, in the Boston bombing, the CIA and the FBI had already talked to the people. The same with the one in San Bernardino. And that's just a fucking coincidence, I guess. And if they're not part of a bigger terrorist plot, how is that even really different than just regular violence? Because they say they were independent, both the Boston bombing and the San Bernardino shooting. They weren't part of any groups. They were just independent. So is that bigger than somebody who just does it on their own? I mean, whatever happened to crazy? Just because, they're, you know, does the average person uh, read a book about Islam and then go kill people? Because this was a guy who was born in the U.S. So, uh, I, I don't know. And as far as support, U.S. support of terrorism, I want to make sure uh, I cover this. I, I know we only got like um, four minutes, but... Just just so uh, everybody knows, and you can comment on any of these, I mean, before Afghanistan, before the war, $500 million was given to the Mujahideen before that, so by uh, the U.S. government. CIA and MI6 trained and funded them. That was before the war. So... They also, you know, gave money to out to Al Qaeda and Osama bin Laden during the war. So they created those two terrorist organizations, and that's fact. That's not even debatable. Clinton tried to make a deal with uh, Afghanistan terrorists for an oil pipeline, and I guess now they're doing that pipeline now that they've done what they've done in Afghanistan. Uh, but I, I'm not sure because this was in a uh, video made in like 2005 so maybe they're not America and Britain armed Saddam Hussein in the 80s against uh, I meant against Iran uh, while at the same time I don't know if you remember the Iran Contra scandal where they would buy weapons from Iran sell them to the Contras and then come back with cocaine and sell cocaine the US government yeah that's how the CIA probably funded a lot of their yeah, there was, I don't know, you heard of Rick Ross, probably the rapper, oh, yeah. but there's the real Rick Ross yeah. who was uh, got money from the CIA. Yeah, um, He didn't know it, but he was, not money, but he was getting drugs from the CIA and he didn't even know it. Yeah. So, uh, and that story broke. The guy who broke that story later, they ruled it a suicide, shot himself twice in the head. Wow. Twice in the, I don't know how you, sh there's a movie on it called Kill the Messenger. Have you seen that? No, but I've heard Based about on it, his yeah. life. Yeah. But he, his death was ruled a suicide. He was shot twice in the head. I don't know how you shoot yourself twice in the head. Um, you know, whatever. Uh, of course, drone bombings. We don't know how many all the time kills innocent civilians. Bradley Manning released those documents that showed how many people really died in Iraq. It was like 141,000, but that's counting everybody. I think even the small amount of Americans that got killed. Um, America installed the dictator, the Shah of Iran, who killed a lot of people. They backed the dictator in Indonesia, who killed a million people. They released Agent Orange. Um, on people in Vietnam. In 1973, they overthrew the government of Chile, killing 30,000, including the elected president. The Iran-Contra scandal, which we just talked about. Hundreds of thousands of innocent people killed and the damage caused in Iraq, Libya, Afghanistan, S Syria, and, of course, the list goes on, Vietnam. Uh, secret operations and attacks in many countries via the CIA and special forces. And at, at the end, I'll let you, I'll just go through this, and then at the end, if you have any comments, um, I'll I'll let you do those just so I can get through this. Um, 
occupations of countries all over the world via military bases, as we talked about, uh, kidnapping of people in the U.S. for choosing to put what's in their own body. That's, of course, what I talked about with drugs. Not to mention all the uh, beatings and murder by cops. I had I showed you the pictures of the bruises all over me, and that was just uh, not even beating me. That was just taking me out of my car. Uh, Doctors Without Borders were bombed like a month ago. And then false flag terrorism, or I don't know if it's exactly false flag in San Bernardino. It may be just FBI, and same with Boston bombing CIA. But, you know, Oklahoma City, World Trade Center, the French shooting, Boston bombing, San Bernardino shooting, and the war on terror increased terror. So in this article, they talk about how the war on terror actually them going after this increased terrorist attacks. So I don't know if you have anything you want to add there or final comments uh, before we go. Yeah, one second. I wanted to pull up an article I read from the BBC today. It's the best to go. So, yeah, essentially the U.S. government has committed more murders, more terrorism than any of these terrorist organizations, at least relating to the West. Now, what the stuff they've done in their own countries, I can't speak to. I know they've done a lot of fucked up things in their own countries. However... A lot of those things and those governments were installed by the U.S. government. And that's why I had mentioned the Shah of Iran and the dictator. I don't don't know if he was a dictator, but I believe he was in Indonesia, um, as well as the 30,000 in Chile that they had killed along with the president. I've never heard of that. And that's a September 11th that I guess most people have never heard of. September 11th, 1973. So you have a government where, and don't get me wrong, as I had said earlier, I'm not anti-U.S. I'm anti-government because I see what it does. If other governments had the power the U.S. had, they'd be doing the same thing. And one of the things that the U.S. hasn't done as much of, even though they have done, is they've done more damage to other countries than to people in their own. Although that's starting to get worse as well. Are are you ready for your... Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I was just reading an article today, and it's uh, it's from February of 2009. And it's a former M... MI5, you know, uh, chief. England's uh, CIA. Yeah, it's a former chief. And they uh, and she said, she mentions what you said earlier about how, you know, it's going to create more terrorism. She said, I think that people are fully aware that the more you intrude into civil liberties, the more you set up grievances for people to, you know, encourage people to do all the unpleasant things that are actually going on. So, you know, I mean, it's like you're setting up a bandwagon and you're producing hate and stirring up hate and controversy in ways that it's beneficial to them and beneficial to more laws being put against us, but it's not at all beneficial to the people or the reasons they say what they're doing. You know, it's not going to ever fix any kind of terrorism to cause false flag attacks all over the place. Yeah, no, it it does make sense that it's going to cause more um, terrorism. So it's been your, your first show. I know you were sick, so... Um, and I thank you so much for coming by and doing the show, um, especially in the state that you're in. And I'm so sorry that you're, you're sick and still came, but is there anything you want to say, um, you know, before we, uh, go? No, just thanks for having me. It was nice to be here talking. Unfortunately I was sick, but hopefully next week I'll be in better spirits and won't be, (laughs) won't be sick on you. Well, I definitely hope you get better, and I'm sure everybody listening hopes you get better as well. And then, um, of course, you'll be more involved in the show. So don't think 
that Vivian uh, won't be uh, a lot more involved in the show when she gets better. And even sick, uh, she did a great job. And she definitely showed that she is very intelligent and can add a lot to the show and is definitely a uh, somebody who can add value to the show. So I'm really happy to have her as a co-host. So we will be back on Tuesday. Um, I'm not sure what we're talking about. For the people who don't listen next week at all, have a happy holidays or Merry Christmas or whatever. But we will be broadcasting live on Christmas Eve uh, with Vivian co-hosting. So be sure to tune in uh, on Thursday as well. So we'll be here Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. And actually Tuesday, Shire Dude will be joining us, I believe. It's either Tuesday or Wednesday. I got to check on that one. Uh, he'll be jo- no, it's Wednesday. I'm sorry. So Wednesday, Shire Dude will be joining us. Tuesday, it will be just me, and then uh, Thursday, Christmas Eve, Vivian will be joining us. So thanks everybody for tuning in. I appreciate it, and I will or you will hear me on. He will defend Tuesday. Listen to police officers' commands, listen to what we tell you, and just stop. The nation needs to realize that when we tell you to do something, do it. And if you're wrong, you're wrong. If you're right, then the courts will figure it out. We don't get to take it. We force it. And at the end of the day, each and every man to go home safe. Sometimes the use of force is necessary. You need to comply with the police officer the way the system was meant to be. Comply with the orders of police officers. Resisting arrest is a real and dangerous 